Welcome to Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. It is 1.30 and I see we have... Um, excuse me, um, the interpreter, do you need to um, give me the channel? Or okay. give me the, the link to... Yeah, so, so I'm so going to let Ruth and, um, and uh, Gina uh, respond to that. I think Tony had said she was going to run a video at the beginning of this meeting, but I just need to call it, call the meeting. Uh, right. so, uh, Tony, are you, if you're not on, maybe Gina or... Oh, I just, uh, this is Tony, I just handled it. Perfect. And do you want to run that, that uh, video, Tony? Yes. Thank you. We only have Spanish interpretation for this meeting. And would you like me to call roll? Uh, yes. So you ran. Uh, you yeah, ran. That was it. Oh, that Just was that it. One. Oh, yeah, that was it. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, Tony. Please uh, call roll. A roll. Jimenez. Present. Cohen. Esparza. Here. Crosco. Here. Arenas. Here. Perfect. So uh, the, we're going to move on to Neighborhood Services Education Committee. Uh, today is the 11th of March. And uh, we're going to um, skip the review of work plan and consent calendar because there isn't anything under those items and go directly to reports to the committee. Um, and the first one is, yeah, Robert, if I could just, uh, I, I think there is under the orders of the day, there is a deferral. Okay. Uh, we, we are uh, maybe deferring the Office of the Immigrant Affairs uh, report to April. And so if we could uh, uh, do that under order, orders of the day. Uh, orders of the day. Uh, um... Karen, I don't see orders of the day, but I do see review of work plan. Could yes, we... we would typically do it under review of work plan. That would be fine through a motion. Okay. okay. Uh, do I have a motion to defer the uh, item? Motion to the... defer. Second. Okay. Tony, you want to call roll? Uh, Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Jimenez? Aye. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you so much, uh, Angel, for inter for uh, intervening there. Um, so we're going to move forward with the first item now, which is our uh, digital literacy uh, report. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Michelle Arnott, Deputy Director of Public Services for San Jose Public Library. This staff update on digital inclusion is a cross-departmental report from the library, PRNS, and CETF. Slide, please. Yeah. Today's presenters are Carla Alvarez, the Library's Community Programs Administrator for Equity and Inclusion, Samantha Kramer, the Library's Education and Programming Services Manager, Anne Grabowski, the Library's Chief of Staff and Manager of Policy and Analytics, Laura Buzo, Recreation Superintendent for Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, and Charlene Tatis with the California Emerging Technologies Fund. Next slide, please. Today's updates will concentrate on the digital inclusion branch of the EOC, an update on the digital literacy quality standards and progress on the digital inclusion fund. All of these points work towards advancing the city's digital inclusion three A's framework with the goal of empowering all San Jose residents and learners to utilize existing and emerging technologies to their fullest potential. Access to devices and Wi-Fi connectivity, information and application support for affordable internet plans, and adult, and adult, excuse me, and digital literacy skills building programs that will lead to full digital adoption. And now Carla will speak to the more specific pieces around the emergency digital equity efforts. Carla? Hello. Um, by September 2020, 
San Jose Public Library successfully procured 15,800 hotspots to support the connectivity needs of San Jose students and residents. 12,800 were delivered to local education agencies and 3,000 hotspots are now part of the library's general circulation. As part of our commitment to equity and inclusion, the first months of the SJ Access Initiative were reserved to prioritize vulnerable community members who were underconnected or, or unconnected. We created a hotspot priority reserve for, uh, for the library's program participants and for interested community-based organizations to refer their participants to the hotspots. The partnering CBOs were also provided with multilingual outreach material to share directly with their participants as they are the trusted voices locally. And the use of our maker spaceship is also an important way that we bring the, the library to diverse communities and facilitate access to folks that may otherwise be limited due to transportation needs and other factors. To date, we have partnered with 32 local education agencies for hotspots distributions and 22 community-based organizations signed up for the priority reserve. And many more nonprofits, businesses, and places of worship have helped us cross-promote these resources. As of today, we have over 80, 82% of our, of our hotspots are checked out. We have been able to collect some demographic information from hotspot borrowers from the library's general circulation. That helps us better understand the impact that this initiative is having in terms of bridging the digital divide in San Jose. These figures listed here are provided based on 676 responded to our optional survey received um, during when the people are checking out their devices. And they're not still including um, the hotspots that were directed to high needs neighborhoods through the local education agencies, including in San Jose. As you can see, um, the library actually began this initiative by prioritizing the branches with the highest digital connectivity needs. Uh, and they were Alam Rock, Biblioteca Latinoamericana, Edenville, Hillview, King, and Tully. And these branches have significantly higher circulation and checkout rate compared to all the other library branches with express pickup. In terms of race and ethnicity, communities of color represent the largest share of the borrow demographics. And hotspots borrowers report using the hotspots for a range of activities. Hi everyone, Ann Grabowski um, with our Emergency Operations Center and the library. Many of you will remember, and, and because of um, many of you and the strong direction that you provided by the council last June, um, we funded and expedited five new attendance areas for our East Side Wi-Fi project. Um, and the city is directly funding three of these areas. So just a, a quick update on how we're doing in that project. Your direction and leadership on behalf of students and families came um, directly from many of you on this committee. And we're so very pleased to share that significant progress has been made. When we were first analyzing the attendance areas, we noted that um, that we, we needed to find a fiber solution for the Mount Pleasant and Ever and Silver Creek attendance areas. And the initial, you'll probably remember that the initial estimate was roughly a $10 million um, cost to run fiber out to that area. But after further analysis, staff believes that the solution is closer to $250,000 to connect that area with fiber. And um, it the solution could be as simple as simply pulling fiber through existing conduit to the Mount Pleasant area, and that would serve both Mount Pleasant and Silver Creek attendance areas. Um, staff and DOT and Public Works are finalizing their analysis and recommendation on timeline and approach right now. We'll bring the final funding estimate and timeline to the council as part of the April council action to review the funding agreement with Eastside Union High School District. And once that fiber pull is complete, uh, is committed and approved, then we'll move these areas into the design phase of the project. Currently in the design phase of the project, we have the independence area, which started design about a month and a half ago, and Andrew P. Hill, Oak Grove uh, attendance area will start in April. And as those um, project areas complete their design, then they will have a of a waterfall effect into, into construction. And so we're expecting construction to start on the independence attendance area in this, this summer, probably late July. And that should open um, in the late fall, probably November timeframe. And the rest of the attendance areas will follow 
hopefully follow closely after work, continuing to work with vendors and contractors on efficiencies. Um, that's our quick update. Happy to take questions on this project after we're done. Uh, I know that it's, um, it's a deeply meaningful project and one that many of you are very passionate about. But for now, we'll go back to Carla. This is actually me, I think. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Samantha, as, as uh, Michelle mentioned. I'll be taking us through the next few slides. Um, so we will start off with our internet connectivity options. Uh, both SJPL and PRNS have distributed information on affordable internet plans and benefit programs available to eligible families through a variety of methods, including workshops, uh, flyers, and through our digital literacy programming, which I will talk a little bit more about um, in the coming slides. Uh, next slide, please. And I will also be providing an update on the creation of an assessment tool for the digital literacy quality standards, uh, which was already approved uh, through city council back in May of 2020. This tool creates a user-friendly checklist whereby participating organizations can rate themselves in each of the digital literacy quality standard focus areas in order to establish a baseline rating for their program. This assessment tool is designed to measure the quality of the program content uh, as well as its delivery and users may score not met, basic, emerging, or advanced according to the definitions within each focus area as outlined in the quality standards itself. The tool also provides space for reflection and planning on how users may work to eventually meet the advanced rating, allowing for continuous quality improvement in every program. This assessment tool will, will now be implemented along with the quality standards as a whole uh, in the programs outlined in the fiscal year 2020-2021 uh, implementation plan with the goal of expanding to additional city and digital inclusion fund related programs in subsequent fiscal years. Um, and next slide. Thank you. Um, I will also be taking us through um, our digital inclusion fund update uh, for SJPL. Uh, in order to better meet the needs of our underconnected or high needs households, uh, SJPL approached their digital inclusion fund program uh, through two main ways with an overarching digital literacy component across the board. These two programs include a device lending program through SJPL branch locations and a loan to own program with refurbished laptops uh, with a digital literacy training as a key component for each of these programs. Uh, starting with our device checkout kits, um, we had 35 pilot laptops. Um, they have all been checked out multiple times um, and are out uh, now for their second round of circulation. Uh, in terms of our refurbished device giveaway, uh, we partnered with the CalWORKS Social Services Agency uh, to distribute those loan to own uh, refurbished laptops. Um, as of the end of February 2021, a total of 186 refurbished devices were distributed and 72 SJ Access hotspots were checked out at that time. Uh, we have also hosted our digital literacy trainings. Um, our Family Learning Center coordinators um, have hosted the first several cohorts now of Zoom-based digital literacy courses. We've hosted courses in both English and Spanish um, and intend to launch Vietnamese shortly. Um, our digital literacy course is available on the SJPL's website through our uh, articulate online learning platform uh, that anyone in the community can access and use. Um, and looking ahead at our digital inclusion fund programs, uh, we have additional Chromeback, Chromebooks and iPads uh, that are currently being assembled into checkout kits um, and we'll go into circulation uh, a little bit later this fiscal year. And with that, I will kick it over to uh, our friends at Parks and Rec. Good afternoon, Laura Buzo with Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services. PRNS Digital Inclusion Grant Programming. So over the last uh, few months, um, in order to continue addressing the digital divide and social isolation, particularly among older adults, PRNS uh, secured a $49,000 grant in December from SourceWise. This will give us the opportunity to leverage these fundings with other uh, digital uh, related 
uh, funding sources that we receive through the Digital Inclusion Fund, as well as Kaiser. And this will increase our ability to access uh, digital devices and affordable internet services, um, as well as address the digital inclusion and literacy gaps among older adults, youth, and lower resource communities through the following. Um, to send out device lending, so ability to uh, loan out digital devices to families and older adults, affordable internet services, as was mentioned earlier, hotspot lending, and digital literacy classes, both virtually and in person. PRNS is currently in the planning process with ante anticipated launch of device lending program, as well as our digital literacy classes, virtual health and wellness activities in the spring. Um, so coming up soon, we look forward to sharing that with you in the future. Next. Oh, I'm sorry, Laura. I thought uh, Charlene here. <laughs> I thought um, you were saying next slide. My apologies um, for the delay there. And I am having trouble with my connection here. Sorry, give me one second. Oh, I know of a program that offers great resources. <laughs> <laughs> well, for whatever reason, my screen share isn't showing this is so weird charlie um, it always happens uh go ahead and try to work that out uh well i mean i can present without showing myself too yes. but my apologies I, why don't is, i just this is tony um we may need to carla needs to unshare her screen if you're going to share it or i can unshare carla's screen myself um but you're probably not able to share because she's sharing well, I was able to get my video to work, so there we go. I'm happy about that. And um, no, that's okay. I can um, there try that. That I think I think that they're they're going to um, move the slides for me. So um, if you can um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Carla. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello, good afternoon, council members, committee members, thank you. My name is Charlene Tatis. I'm the program director with the California Emerging Technology Fund. And I'm here to talk about uh, the updates for the fund. Um, as you all may recall, in February of 2020, City Council awarded $1 million to 23 um, grantee partners to achieve 4,000 adoptions. So connect 4,000 households with internet, a device, and the digital literacy skills proficiency necessary to achieve their goals in life. Uh, grantees were provided self-assessment tools and a base curricula to be, to be able to verify the digital literacy profici proficiency and to meet the outcomes set by city council. CTF and grantees have together worked diligently to manage unforeseen and unprecedented circumstances in making adjustments to the implementation of the grants and providing additional flexibility for grantees to meet the required outcomes in the grant agreements. Um, further, given that the city's emergency response um, focus to work with school districts to get all students online for distance learning um, <laughs> and to meet the target number of households. So in order to do that, we took the following actions, um, extend the end date of grant agreements with modified work plans to take into account shelter in place and social distance constraints. We assured grant payments for extensive outreach and self-assessments to de develop a wide funnel of eligible households and generate a pipeline for adoptions. We reduced requirements for retaining documentation of new internet service and modified circumstances requiring observation of tasks to verify digital literacy proficiency. And we expanded categories of unconnected households eligible for an adoption. And lastly, we deferred element three of the digital literacy training and set six hours of training with observed proficiency as the requirement for completion of an adoption. 
Um, and we've also agreed with our board to revise element three for round two of grants. Um, and then lastly, we'll also be working in round two to incorporate the digital literacy quality standards led by the library. Um, and so we're excited to, to make headway in, in that as well. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so lastly, this is just a look. The funnels will um, is, is a visual for the, um, the work that we've achieved in the last three quarters. Um, and the progress we've made towards those adoptions. So as you'll see, we have to date completed uh, 347 adoptions and we've identified 5,986 potential adoptions. Thank you. And that concludes our presentation for today. We're happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go to our public comment on this. And I think Ruth, you're gonna uh, call our, our public comment folks. Okay, I, I can do that. Uh, so the first one- I got one it. Hi, this is Tony, I'll, I'll do it. Paul Soto? No, no worries. I, Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council, and I'd like to extend my gratitude for all of the work that this uh, the organizations have done in order to bridge that uh, digital divide. I would like to talk a little bit about why we have the divide in the first place, and we need to get comfortable with these this kind of language. I heard uh, unconnected, high needs. Um, I heard lower resource communities. And I know that there's no real intention behind those uh, euphemistic terms. However, we're talking about redlining and generational deprivation of wealth and investment in resources in these communities. And so we're dealing with two things. We're dealing with the uh, COVID related issues. However, there is a gentrification process that has happened because of that uh, resource neglect that has happened in these particular areas. Um, there's a documentary out, it's called The Kids We Lost, and in that documentary, it talks about explicitly that uh, bankers and mortgage companies and uh, auto loan companies invest in futures because they know that when children are having social and economic issues within the home in the third and fourth grades, and the behavioral problems associated with that start surfacing within the context of the schools. They borrow against those troubled kids because they know that eventually they're going to end up, it's predictable. There's a scientific method to this that is predictable that they're going to end up in a prison cell. I was one of those kids. I was one of those ones that was lost. Okay. And so my advocacy at this particular group for this item is on behalf of those children. Mm -hmm. I know who they are and I know what they're up against. And so I would like to avail that Conexión does some excellent work in this area. I, I, I would really like to extend an invitation to any council member that would like to come down here and, and really talk to the senoras here that um, do some really excellent work in that area and that could use some help. Thank you. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, to comment a bit on Paul's words, if I can, uh, you know, the work I do with open open public policy ideas, uh, it's meant to help kids a lot as well. And I, I think it can give them a really good foundation and structure about how life can work well in this country and how it's meant to work well and continue to work well in good sustainable ideas uh, of that open public policy can offer uh, a local community and in our country and um you know i i suppose this should be the time that uh you know with with all the needs to bridge the digital divide and what, what that can work towards how much open public policy you know just to remind really needs to be a part of that future process and it isn't just getting the four and 5g placed in local neighborhoods and getting the kids with laptops it's teaching them you know the civics of of good practices once they have that technology 
And I, I think there's an important uh, goal that we, we, we describe what can be our good practices and our good persons and our better selves. And that's, that's important work uh, along with uh, bridging the digital divide. So I hope you don't uh, forget about open public policy ideas and learn that it's, it can be friendly stuff and it can be included in, in, in what we're building at this time. Uh, I've got 27 seconds to, to politely comment on uh, you know an item that was uh, put off until April now. I had an old agenda from last, you know, just a few days ago. And that was saying the meeting was gonna, uh, the uh, uh, immigration item was gonna be on the agenda and talked about, but now it's not. The, I, hopefully this could be for Tony as a way to practice how to update agendas. How can, how can that help so I can know that? <laughs> Tony, do you have a, a moment to um, answer that question? I'm not the person who manages this this agenda, um, but we we did find out last night that this item is going to be deferred, and we were told to just do it under orders of the day. Um, okay, Th thank you, Tony. All right, uh, now I'm going to move on to our panelists. Um, and I don't see any uh, raised hands on this. Oh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, just a quick question to staff, and, and I could certainly take the, the answer offline if we don't know the answer, because I didn't ask ahead of time, so my apologies. But I know during the last budget session, I think my office requested, I think it was upwards of $70,000 or so to purchase some devices for Oak Grove School District. I'm wondering if, do, do we know if that ever took place or if that money was ever sort of given to the school district? Yes, council member, thank you very much. Um, that Those funds were executed in the early fall. Um, the city executed those funds directly to Oak Grove um, based on the budget action. I, I feel like it was September, I think is when we, we cut the check, but those yep. were executed. Cool, thank you so much, Anne, appreciate mm -hmm. it. Great, and um, I don't see any more hands, so I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, oh, here we have uh, Council Member Sparsa. Go I'm ahead. I'm happy to go after you. That's fine. No, and, and that that's fine, Council Member Sparsa. Um, well, I know. I just, in the interest of time, I just wanted to point out um, and thank my colleagues, in particular, um, Council Member Arenas, Council Member Carrasco, actually Council Member Carrasco twice over as a former Eastside um, Union High uh, School Board uh, member, um, and then as a Council Member um, for the work on community Wi-Fi. Um, we fought pretty hard for that last year um, and during the pandemic and really at the request of um, our local school board members who reached out right away, um, and I know I'll miss folks, but from the East Side School District, from Oak Grove, from Franklin McKinley, from Evergreen, um, Allen Rock School Districts, and I think we had Cambrian as well, and San Jose Unified School District members reached out to us um, early on, knowing that our communities would be in crisis. Um, and so my fellow school board members on the council um, fought pretty hard. And we were one of the early cities to do this work. Um, and although the community Wi-Fi predates COVID, um, we really uh, were one of the few cities to accelerate this due to COVID. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, and thank the team. Uh, it was very exciting to see that James Lick and Overfell were completed um, and that YB was completed. Um, and I have a question on Andrew Hill. Um, ironically, I'm having some technical issues. What's the date for Andrew Hill? I noticed I didn't see one. So I wanted to ask, what is the date? Remember, we are still... Um... I hesitate to say a date, not because we don't have one, but because we're trying to expedite. Um, so I, okay. I believe that it's early 2022 is when Andrew Hill it should go online. Um, but I know that we are working diligently to try and expedite that timeline as much as possible. So we're hoping that we'll, it will be before the beginning of 2022. Okay, yeah, appreciate the efforts to expedite. I know um, 
uh, that we were really the efforts to expedite or expediting the exp expediting <laughs> at this point in the project. Um, but Andrew Hill and Oak Grove are both in areas that have been hard hit by um, COVID um, and some of our uh, really very high need areas that um, folks don't tend to think about either one of those um, high school casement areas. Um, so uh, the need is great. Um, and that's it. I'll leave the, in the interest of time, I'll um, leave it to um, Council Member Adenas. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that reminder. Yeah, our school board members wrote in a letter um, asking us uh, to respond to this need. And I'm so glad that, that our school board members are um, uh, looking out for our students as, as is our um, uh, public library department and our PRNS department. I know that they are just absolutely passionate and you all have worked really hard to get this up and going, but uh, thank you council member Esparza for the efforts that you've made and council member Carrasco uh, likewise, and I know uh, Councilmember Jimenez uh, for sure wanted to add some additional uh, resources to his as 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 he should. And so I'm going to start off with that piece. If we could get in our in when this cross references to council a final list of the school districts. I know we had a, a list of anticipate uh, uh, of list of LEAs that had requested the second order, right? And um, are you raising your hand, Councilmember Carrasco? Oh. Did Wait, you want to <laughs> right now? <laughs> Wasn't sure. I know because my, my hand fades into the, my background into the wall. Can you see it? Oh, okay. You, you see that? Yes, we can. <laughs> And so I'm sorry, and I and I had oral surgery, so I'm I can't. Don't make me laugh. Right now, can I just make a point real fast before you make a conclusion? I just got some alarming statistics from because um, today is our uh, our one year uh, anniversary of uh, of uh, the pandemic, and I got some alarming statistics regarding. Um, how this, uh, this this last year has impacted our kiddos uh, educationally, and and uh, and especially when you look at, uh, of course, I was looking at Eastside Union High School District and and the kiddos that didn't go back to school, and we know that when you looked at Eastside Union High School District, um, and, and all in Rock, in fact, but Eastside Union High School District in particular, they were disconnected for a very long time from their learning. <clears throat> in great part because, well, they were disconnected. We, we didn't have the infrastructure and the bandwidth for kids to continue their, their um, long distance learning. Uh, and, you know, given the fact that we're looking at this as, uh, as part of uh, the support that we're giving our families and our children, I'd like to be able to note that it, it's, you know, our effort is to is to support kiddos. Um, I think that noting it is of particular importance, if for nothing else, to memorialize what the impact of COVID has has done to our communities. I I think to be able to memorialize also gives uh, uh, really due respect uh, to those communities that have been the hardest hit. Uh, you know, I know that it, it's almost a misnomer when you say Eastside Union High School District because it's not just on East of 101. Uh, a lot of those schools span um, in other areas of the city. But uh, what was really alarming to me, but it shouldn't be of any surprise, almost 3,000 kiddos didn't go back to school. Uh, and where are they? I, I don't know where they are. Uh, and I know that that could be for a, a whole host of reasons, but I think that we can almost draw a conclusion as to what happened to them. Uh, you know, when you disengage for a whole year, uh, you know, the pandemic hit March of last year. So March, April, May, uh, almost June, that's four months of being disconnected. 
I mean, you, you lose so much. We talk about the summer, what is it? The summer slippery, the summer, the summer slide. And uh, so now you don't have the summer slide. Now it's basically a pandemic slide. It's a whole year slide. And, uh, and now I've looked at just recently again, also how much they've lost. And it's dramatic. It's really dramatic. Uh, I used to think it was it was frightening to see what kids lost during the summer, but what we're looking at, what kids are losing uh, because of the pandemic, it's uh, you know I think we have to come up with a new word that's that doesn't that's not alarming. It's beyond alarming, and I don't know what that new you know I'm not a linguistic, but I think we have to come up with something uh, that's specifically pandemic related, and. Um, and 52%, by the way, of those 3,000 kids were Latino, 52%. Uh, I want to know where they are. You know, I hope that, I hope the district is trying to find them or, or kept statistics, but I think we have to ask about that. Anyway, my point is, uh, with that faded little hand that's up in that corner, I'm going to try and see if I can change the, the color of it. Uh, but, but, but my point is, if we could find a paragraph somewhere where we could put that statistic because I think what we need to do in all of our reports right now that is that is alluding to the pandemic in any efforts that we have related to the pandemic which is almost everything that we did this past year I think we need to memorialize the consequences the results of and the um the effects of I think we owe it to our. I think we owe it to our our our, uh, our survivors, as well as those who didn't survive. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to uh, add that chair, um, yeah. because we're we're so far from this being over. I know that we're all starting to feel good because of the vaccine, but we're really far from being over post post COVID nineteen only means that we're going to now start having to deal with the effects of COVID-19 and the trauma um, of what this really means. And that means uh, how behind our kids are, how we're going to have to deal with this next generation of trauma. And and, and Paul continues to bring this up, Paul, uh, Mr. Paul Soto. He talks about the trauma and the impact of generations uh, long gone. But now how do we deal with the, with the impact of this generation and how we speak of it? And 10 years from now, we'll be speaking just as Paul is speaking about it, but we'll be speaking about the pandemic generation. So anyway, so I just wanted to make that point because I know we have a very heavy agenda. We're going to be speaking yeah. about uh, you know, at, at some point about the Immigration uh, Office on Immigrant Affairs, we're going to be speaking on the Office of Race and Equity. We're going to be speaking on uh, the Mayor's Gang Task Force. We're going to be speaking on uh, Hope Project. And all of that has been impacted by the pandemic. And in it, I, I find it to be a moral imperative for us to remember our lost lives. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just one correction, Council Member Carrasco, we deferred uh, the report from the Office of Immigrant Affairs to next month. Yeah, but but in the future, I, I see what you're saying yeah. to, to make sure that these aren't um, siloed conversations, but that we carry the thread of the impact to our children and to our community, the loss of lives and the loss of education um, and what that means in the long run for our community um, who is struggled so much to get to a certain point of progress. So uh, absolutely. And I also want to uh, thank Mr. Soto for um, for reminding us uh, of that um, and, and uh, sharing his own experience as, as, a, as a Latino man who uh, typically are the ones who um, uh, unfortunately have that um, uh, prison pipeline that he talked about um, as a consequence for loss of learning. So, okay, Councilman, uh, can, I, uh, can, yes. can I say, you know, I, 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 I want to thank Councilmember Carrasco for, for that framing and context because I think it is very important because what we're seeing throughout this entire emergency response is exactly what she framed and, and exactly what Paul Soto mentioned also, right? Because we, we know that these issues were always within our community 
COVID just really exacerbated them, right? It, it kind of highlighted them. And so and, and this digital inclusion approach, for example, is a good example of how we can be very intentional in accelerating the response to those needs, you know? A lot of the behind the scenes work, you know, I know we've really truncated this presentation today because we got a loaded agenda, but, um, you know, when you look at the behind the scenes work, there was a lot of uh, equity um, overlays that were put onto this. And if you take a look at the distribution of hotspots, the 4,000, the, the 5,600 that are imminent, the, the $1 million in grants, when you take a look at the concentration of that work, you'll find that it's significantly weighted towards meeting those communities most in need, right? And so I think it's a good example of how we could really accelerate and really apply pressure to the problem uh, mm -hmm. if we do it in a concerted manner, right? But I think uh, uh, Councilmember Carrasco really framed that extremely well around, we also need to memorialize this and, and add this to how we define the problem because they, these are very entrenched. So anyway, I, I really appreciated that framing in context. So I just wanted to convey that. And I know the council members on this committee have been the champions of this effort, right? And so I, I think this is a good, good example of how when you have championing uh, at the elected official level, coupled by work at the administration level and in all the different departments, we can do some good work if we're intentional about it. So, um, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to move into my comments because we do have four more items. Yeah. Council Member, you know, want to wrap that up? Yeah, if, if I could just say, I, I think I, I want us to always remember, however, we, we moved into this uh, in, uh, in, in the swiftest way uh, possible by, by moving as much as we could within our power. Uh, however, we lost according to the numbers that we saw this morning, 3,000 kiddos. Uh, again, I don't know why, I can only speculate. And, and, and the kids lost as much as they did uh, because they were not connected. Now, uh, you know, we, we look at this report and the report looks great because everybody was able to move, like you said, Angel, with that intentionality and, and the lens for equity. I can't help but but think, and this is my, and, and I'm sorry to put on my hat of half empty. I can't help but think, what could we have accomplished had we had done this earlier? And had we already had that investment there and not had to have moved with such swiftness to remedy an issue of disparity uh, and, and, uh, and, and have looked at, and we keep saying, but COVID only exasperated. So had we already been dealing with it and I had to have been convincing people that we had disparities, could we have been dealing truly with what the pandemic was, which was saving lives at a biological level versus all these social inequities. And so I don't wanna lose the fact that, that those were the structural racial issues. And I think that's why it's so important to deal with memorializing this, that we were running around dealing with- Okay, now- We were running around dealing with issues that should not have been part of the pandemic. The pandemic was biological, it was medical. It was, you know, uh, saving, literally saving lives versus education versus, you know, all these other things. And so that's why I think it's so important to memorialize that. And, and before we uncork the champagne and say, wow, we, we had such great programs. I think we go back to the root and go, this cannot happen again. It cannot happen again. These are the lessons learned. And, this, and that's why memorializing it every single time and saying we just wasted, not that we wasted time, but we, we ran around having to fix this when we already knew it was a problem. We can't do this again. The big one is coming. Another pandemic is coming and it might be more fiercer and deadlier, more contagious uh, and more widespread. We cannot go through this again. And, and so anyway, so that's it. That's it for me, thanks. And thank you, council member. I still have uh, some questions and, and along that line of, in terms of always uh, thinking about um, the hardest to reach population, uh, I, you know, I read this report with with a magnifying glass because it's so important to me, and I was so pleased to see all uh, really some great some great work on behalf of PRNS and the library. 
Um, and then the way that, that that work was coordinated, I saw that PRNS was doing a lot of outreach and connecting um, uh, information uh, to our communities um, in a way that I think uh, works because they have relationships with those groups in the community. And so I really like that. I, I really liked how uh, uh, the loan to own program was connected with CalWORKs uh, recipients that was very new um, and uh, much needed. Um, and, um, and then I, of course, I saw the quality standards. Um, and so I, I do have some questions just about uh, uh, some of those areas. One of which is, uh, now that I'm on the CalWORKs um, piece, I'll start with that. Did we um, ever take a look at, um, now that we're focused uh, on making sure that we, uh, we look at why it is that we started this and this is because of connectivity so that we don't have learning loss, have we gone back to see, and that was my original request, my request, or the beginning of my comments were to request um, an updated um, list of LEAs that have received, and CBOs that have received um, and how many how many computers um, or devices and hotspots they received and they have access to. Um, I do want to commend the list is really great. I had requested Nextdoor Solutions to be part of that. Um, and thank you for following up and, and making sure those folks have that um, as, as uh, survivors of uh, domestic violence, we're going into offices to use computers um, and, and and now they can facilitate their connection much easier that they have a hotspot and that literally can save a life of a person and so I really want to thank you for that um, the, the other way that we're going to save lives is to make sure that that summer slide and that this whole pandemic uh, learning slide doesn't impact which we know it has already impacted our children um, and so I'm going to uh, uh, um, I'm going to ask about gaps. So we know who we gave these um, devices to, and we know who we gave um, our hotspots because primarily we're responsible for hotspots, but there was devices that you purchased and refurbished. Um, can we take a, another inventory to see, um, or check in to see if there is any gaps? Um, and one of the ways that I thought, you know, I, I was just wondering through our distance learning, of course, everybody has to have access to uh, a learning pod, um, I mean, a, a device. Did we distribute hotspots that way? Um, uh, did we send them home with the kiddos or, you know, because they were accessing um, the Wi-Fi or the internet in, in that facility, they weren't given a hotspot. So that's one of my questions. Thank you, council member. Um, by and large, the students that were referred to learning pods were referred there because of supervision issues during the day and they may have also lacked connectivity at home. Um, so we were providing connectivity at the learning pod where they could also be supervised, but there have been instances where um, those students have also needed connectivity for you know whatever reason and they've been referred to the library for a checkout if their school did not have a device to give them but we have been triaging those requests as they've come in but at school we've just um allowed the connectivity to exist in our buildings when they came to the learning pod i'm i'm glad to hear that there's a system in place um I, although i'm concerned that the I, I think it's a 90 day checkout from the san jose library for those hot spots are those students also confined to that and then having to check it out and all that or we um we haven't broadcast this but when our librarians understand that it's a student using the device they are um, extending those loan terms to the end of the school year so um it's a it's through conversation with the family even if it's a mom without a kid there or a dad without a kid there Mm -hmm. And we ask if the device is going to be used for distance learning. And when that answer is yes, we automatically extend the due date and let them know that as well. So they're not concerned. Perfect. Perfect. The, the other piece to that, I, I, I really appreciate that and, um, and hope that we can take the checkout idea um, beyond this, the library, I know that I think you you all did it at an event. I can't remember what event it was, um, but I thought that was a, a perfect way for people who are really hard to reach that will not. I so I tried it on my own, tried to check out a hotspot. I actually did not do it, and I wasn't like I didn't hold it or anything like that, so I didn't uh, burden the system. But it was a it was a little. Um, I wasn't sure. <laughs> 
I had to like read it three times to make sure that I was following the directions and it wasn't a clear button. So, um, you know, I managed to get there. I don't know if I'm speaking about my own generational issues with the technology and I'm dating myself. Or, you know, I, I think there's also some some area of improvement for, you know, a role button there that can give you uh, the next step um, versus um, first you have to put a hold, then you have to set up an appointment um, and um, that back and forth. I'm not sure if our hardest to reach folks will do that. And hopefully our CBOs are helping uh, those recipients that way. And so that's the other um, interest is just to have the inventory. I, I, you, you've all been very transparent and given me a lot of information. I appreciate um, all of the CBO, the list of CBOs that you've given me. Um, I just want to know, like, what what is the inventory of those folks? Um, you know, are they given are are they being uh, given enough? And then, um, are they uh, are they using them? You know, I, I don't know. Can you tell, Anne, if they're utilizing these hotspots? Can we tell if the schools are utilizing the hotspots? You can. Yes, um, yeah. So, and to go back to answer your question directly, we'll absolutely give you an updated inventory. Thank you. Um, that, so yes, well, I've put that on our to-do list. Um, we'll get that to you. We can tell if the devices are being utilized um, on a weekly basis. And we, I wanna be very clear with the committee and the public that we are not tracking any traffic that goes through that hotspot. Um, we have no idea what sites folks are utilizing and we have intentionally chosen not to Yes, that's better. Um, monitor the amount of traffic that goes through, except to check in on devices that we know should be active, but are not transmitting data. So I don't want the community to be alarmed about tracking. We're just noting right. whether or not they're receiving any data at all. Um, right. Continuing to work with our partners to make sure that those devices are utilized, especially with the school population, because we know that that's an early indicator of troubleshooting need. Where mm -hmm. they might not know how to use the device or the power cord broke or they lost it and we just need to get them another device or help them troubleshoot and so we're on a weekly basis we communicate with schools um, about that information the cbo referrals are a little bit different in that the cbos are issuing referral codes and the person is directly checking the device out from the mm -hmm. library but we have the connection back to the cbo so mm -hmm. that if there's any issues with the user experience they have an advocate at the CBO that can connect with us as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we are absolutely tracking usage to make sure that they're being, you know, utilized to the greatest extent possible and that we're supporting the community while they're using them. Perfect. And I know that you have some walk-up um, uh, events. I know that the, the makerspace um, came to our Welch uh, Park and has gone through many different parts of San Jose and you, you uh, actually got folks to check out hotspots there and there was quite a bit of them so that was very impressive. I think you know that that kind of um, access is, is great um, and, uh, and hopefully we can continue to facilitate this for our students in a way that's so really easy. Um, and so maybe another maker space tour, I think you guys called it a tour, um, would be wonderful. The last thing that I'm just gonna ask about is um, the quality standards. And I know that there were some folks who, uh, it, some grantees that, um, you know, weren't able to do some, uh, uh, some tasks that were uh, in their contract and, um, um, and I know the quality state they're they're going to you're going to have all of the grantees adopt these quality standards. Um, I'm concerned about um, the end result. So if we have a really small agency that may not uh, have had the the capacity to pivot during um, during COVID, that they will be penalized if they're you know if if uh, they didn't uh, complete or carry out some tasks um, or hold up some of these quality standards because they were just you know covering a lots of holes in, in their, their own respective agencies and in this contract. So do we have some, some flexibility uh, to understand that or will our quality standards just drop people off? I mean, drop off grantees um, into a, a yes and a no uh, in terms of uh, re, re, uh, recommitting funding to them. 
Charlene, I think I'd ask you to answer that question from CETF's perspective because you're managing the grantees. But you know, generally speaking, the city's been very understanding and appreciative of the work of the grantees and acknowledged also that the quality standards were adopted after the grantee contracts were already in place for round one. Um, so Charlene, I'd to the answer specifically, but I think in general, the city's position is that we need folks to have a great quality program and a very thorough experience of support from the grantee, that that's what we expect because we want the good public outcome, but um, are also flexible. Charlene? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Council Member Edenhausen. And um, so we, the digital literacy quality standards will be slowly integrated into the round two um, grant uh, grants once they're already awarded. Therefore, the digital literacy quality standards will not affect the whether or not we will be funding, um, you know, uh, continuing to fund organizations. Organizations will need to reapply. Um, we are looking at the outcomes that were achieved, as 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 you all are aware, and and that the council approved. Um, this is an outcomes-based grant, and so grantees are do receive payment based on the completion of those outcomes. And so we will be looking closely at, um, at not only if they met the outcomes, but then of course, you know, what were some of the barriers that might have prevented them from reaching the outcomes, and how how have they overcome or begun to overcome or plan to overcome those will also um, be taken into consideration for round two. Great. So if they have a plan, um, it sounds like there's some possibility for them to continue. Um, and is there also some possibility of technical assistance from CETF? Yes. In fact, uh, technical assistance has been provided um, from the beginning, even in the round one grant application process. And we continue on a quarterly basis to provide um, all, all group technical support through communities of practice. But uh, my, much of my time is dedicated to also providing one-on-one -on -one support to the grant partners. And so there has been um, a tremendous amount of support provided. And I'm not just saying that because I'm it. <laughs> um, but Laura here from PRNS and um, folks here from the library who are also grantee recipients um, can probably attest to the fact that there's been a great deal of support and um, we continue to be committed to that, not just on a quarterly basis, but you know, as needed um, with myself or others from CTF. And I provide many opportunities for peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning through the communities of practice. Perfect, Charlene. And yeah, and, and you're, um, that is not in question, but it, it's always um, the, the smaller agencies are the neediest, but sometimes those are the ones that are reaching the hardest population, but they're just trying to survive. And so I don't want them to be penalized for this and, and just for them to be able to have an opportunity uh, to kind of redeem if you will, in, in a second phase of this, um, because they might have a, a language specialty, uh, access to Vietnamese uh, community or uh, uh, sexual assault or domestic violence um, uh, victims of. Um, so, so if we can just consider that um, as we're moving along, um, and then maybe asking what what other areas that they need support that you know it's maybe beyond. Um, what CETF can do that we need to bring in maybe another partner. So that that's just something for you to consider. I just don't want to, uh, us to lose anything, any of the good uh, partners that we have. Um, so thank you so much for all of the great work. This is just packed with a lot of really great information. And so I encourage um, our, our community to continue to learn about um, you know, the surveys that you did with the folks who did hotspots, the, just all the great information and services that we've been doing. The work is comp definitely not um, at its end, um, but this is a very exciting time for us because we, we can see the end result. Um, we can see these kiddos. Um, we, I can literally see these kiddos in our learning pods through my, my daughter's uh, classroom, and I can see them. They have access to devices, and so that is really wonderful, but we uh, work is not complete, and I, I want to make sure I honor uh, Councilmember Carrasco's um, message of, of, of ensuring to continue to, to uh, 
carry out the work in, with keeping in mind that there's a huge learning loss for our community. And what it means for them is, um, uh, is could be life changing. So can I get a, amen? No, can I get a- Move approval. <laughs> motion. Wonderful. Move approval, second, or second. I think uh, Council Member Jimenez did, right? I second. Yes, yes. Wonderful. Tony or uh, Ruth? Does, does that does that motion include my, my uh, additions? Uh, sure, can you reflect your uh, addition right the now? The memorialization, is, is that correct? Memorializing um, the conditions prior to the pandemic, is that a correct capture, um, the, Council Member Carrasco? The, the 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 impact on the kiddos uh, since we're we're looking at the hotspots for the kiddos education the the impacts on the kiddos um, maybe under analysis uh, yeah. have have some of that reflected yes in the report yeah including the kiddos that we just saw that have just disappeared they they dropped out mm -hmm. and council member Carrasco is this just uh, to include this when the report comes to the full council or just a, in reports generally, right? Because I think you were talking about globally to, to this adoption and recognition, right? Yeah, if, if we could include it, you're right, actually, uh, global. I don't know why he keeps muting me. Tony, are you muting me on purpose? <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, you know what, uh, globally would be great. I was focusing on this one because these were the numbers that, that were, quite alarming to me, but uh, as, as the conversation was just getting vetted out, uh, to be able to have that uh, as we're moving forward oh. on the rest of the impacts where we can, where we can um, dive into that, uh, especially right now that we're having these conversations and all these reports are coming back to us and it's the yearly mm -hmm. uh, review of the, of the anniversary, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. So, so and just to see if I understand, because I agree with you, but I'm wondering, like, for example, in many, many memos that we get put before before us on many items, they, there's often a background section that essentially lays the framework or the groundwork for what they're going to be discussing, essentially making sure it's, for lack of a better word, boilerplate within everything that we do that it acknowledges that, right? Is that what okay. you're thinking? Yes. Okay. So, so in this case, you know, uh, since the pandemic, we we've lost. What I was able to see is uh, almost three thousand children that uh, didn't graduate, and, you know, and then and then, and I actually have the breakdown uh, demographically, but this was just Eastside Union High School District. I didn't look at the um, I didn't look at the uh, stats for San Jose Unified because, of course, I was focusing on on my district. Uh, and and I was focusing on the digital divide here specifically, so that's why my staff just pulled out these numbers. Okay. So of yeah, course, I, it would be of course know. it would be uh, germane to the report, right? Okay. Cool. Okay, you got that, Tony. <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead, Ruth, or um, wh whoever is going to call a roll for the vote. Okay, uh, Arenas. Oh, Ruth. Yes. Carrasco. Yes. Esparza? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and so we're going to move on to 2019-2020 annual community impact report. This is item D3. Um, and uh, PRNS is going to provide us a, with a presentation. I just want to remind my uh, colleagues that we do have um, three more items after this. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me introduce uh, Charlotte Graham. She's our interim uh, communications manager. And Dave DeLong, our interim division manager over administrative functions, is going to talk a little bit about our fee uh, structure in this report. So this is an annual report. And Charlotte, I believe you're going to begin. Yes, I just need um, the ability to share my screen from my computer. I have my hand raised on my computer side. Is that possible? Here we go. Thank you.
so in the meantime, I can just say good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Charlotte Graham. I'm the interim uh, public information manager for Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. Um, and yes, today we're going to be giving a quick overview of the 2020 Community Impact Report. So this year we followed the theme of going touchless and we made our report available as a simple PDF as well as a mobile friendly version. And the focus areas of the report are PRNS essential places, services, connections, and people. So here you'll see a list of our department's priorities throughout the COVID-19 response. This is alphabetized, uh, not by order of importance. Um, so exactly a year ago, the COVID crisis began uh, to unfold. And as one need in the community revealed another, time and time again, our teams rallied to meet the call by modifying and adapting our programs and services. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it up back over to Dave DeLong now to talk about the financials. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Reynes and uh, committee members. This community impact report satisfies PRNS's obligation under the city policy, city council policy 1-21, which is our pricing and revenue policy, which uh, mandates that we provide an update on our financial sustainability efforts every year. Um, you can see over on the left-hand side of this slide, um, our budget for 1920 was, um, our operating budget was roughly $126 million. Um, what this slide doesn't tell you is that our actual expenses for the year were about $104 million. When you match that with the $25.4 million of revenue that's listed at the bottom of that far left uh, uh, slide, um, we get to 24.4% cost recovery rate relative to um, what we incurred in our operating expenses. Um, the revenues are comprised of grants and interfund transfers from um, capital funds, as well as um, generated revenues from our programming and our facilities. Um, this is substantially lower than the uh, 18 and 19 cost recovery rate, which is about 35.3%. And that's primarily due to the fact that we were enduring a pandemic and that we had to shut down our operations due to shelter in place, you know, in the latter half of the year as we're moving into, you know, our heavy spring and early summer months. Um, looking forward to 2021, you know, our budget is incrementally higher uh, this year. Uh, a lot of that is um, one-time funded items and we're having conversation about um, developing 21-22 with that in mind. Um, we're still a big department, 742 FTE. Um, we probably have about 1,500 people on the books when you count our part-time unbenefited seasonal employees. And looking to next year's report, I'm expecting that we're going to see a big drop off uh, relative to our cost recovery rate, primarily because we haven't been that open for business. Although there's a lot of activity going on, we're not generating a lot of revenue because a lot of that's subsidized. So I would expect that we're going to see a much lower cost recovery rate in uh, our uh, next year's report. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Charlotte. Thank you. So as we look at our essential places in this report, uh, we focus on how PRNS continues providing safe fun and educational outdoor spaces for our community to care for their physical and emotional health and wellness when indoor options are closed. So despite some amenity closures in parks due to public health directives, we've been very successful in mitigating and avoiding park closures as much as possible during the pandemic. And after being cooped up with stay at home orders, everyone has been eager to return to play. Uh, but our parks team, especially maintenance, park rangers, and others out in the field have had to adapt, overcome, and make significant changes to how we operate to continue providing these essential day-to-day -day services. So it's taken a lot of flexibility and perseverance from our teams to keep our parks safe, clean, and green. Uh, and for essential uh, places, we also highlight our PRNS community centers. Though most have had to temporarily close to the public, these are still vital hubs for residents to obtain free and low cost services such as childcare and our senior nutrition program. Our centers are also always prepared to open our doors at a moment's notice to provide a safe place to go during emergencies. And in that last year, uh, multiple community centers provided emergency services, for example, cooling centers, clean air centers, evacuation sites. And we did all of this while following very strict health and safety protocols for visitors and staff. And in addition, over 100 people and families acquired temporary housing at community centers during COVID-19. Uh, so, of course, all city staff serve as disaster service workers in times of need. Uh, and PRNS employees really stepped up to the plate. <laughs> Since March 2020, 
uh, employees from every single division have been deployed across the city to assist with a variety of response and recovery efforts. And the effect of the pandemic on food security in particular hit very hard and fast. So PRNS stepped up to help ensure food security for our most vulnerable residents, not just citywide, but countywide. And I don't have time to give a shout out to every single team in division right now and all the amazing work that they're doing. It's a very long list and the reach of our programs and services is far and wide. Um, but our teams take great pride in our work and the connections and trust we build with our residents. And through perseverance, we've found ways to continue this even during these virtual isolating, these very trying times. Um, so we are very proud of our employees and the work that's been accomplished in this last year. And in the report, we also emphasize the importance of child care services and Beautify SJ. These are essential community focused programs and initiatives. And thanks to community centers and several park facilities, children did get to enjoy some normalcy over the summer with modified camps at 23 locations. And then when it came time to get back to school, we welcomed children back with modified distance learning pods, after school programs, and both virtual and in person preschool programs. And Beautify SJ's efforts are enormous as well. Thanks to this program, litter and graffiti removal has continued through it all. After a significant increase in illegal dumping during the pandemic, this program has worked with volunteers, partners, and other departments across the city to pick up many tons of litter in our public spaces, as well as provide pickup services at large encampments for our unhoused uh, communities in need of trash removal. And through our brand new virtual recreation center, We've also been able to stay engaged and connected with residents of all ages and abilities to provide safe stay-at-home activities that support physical and emotional wellness. So during the county's first stay-in-place or shelter-in-place order, RNS teams provided live classes where people of all ages and abilities enjoyed fun at-home fitness and other activities with real-life instructors. So the VRC, as we call it, is a living web page, and we continue to update it with ideas and activities that help our community stay active, continue learning, engage and explore with others and to connect socially and, and create craft and play. So of course, moving forward, our work is fueled by Activate SJ. This is our 20 year strategic plan that is guiding us into the future using uh, the following five principles, their pu public life, nature, stewardship, equity and access and identity. This is an ongoing continuous effort, uh, of course, and this plan is, uh, and the definitions and goals can be found on our website at activatesj.org. Uh, so moving forward, we recognize that there's much more work to be done in all five of those different areas that I just mentioned. Uh, really, our work is never done. <laughs> there's always going to be curveballs. I don't know if they'll be quite as uh, big as 2020, but um, if, if we learned anything from this last year, it's that our teams are very resilient, they're passionate, and community-focused. And uh, we get a lot of good work done and we can get it done in a, in a pinch to serve our communities. Uh, so that is the end of our presentation. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed the new format of this report. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I'm gonna go to our community for public comment. And it looks like we had a- uh, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Dennis uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, uh, thank you for for the work that uh, PRNS is doing. Uh, I just discovered that you are considered essential workers, so all of you get vaccinated. That was like the theme at the last Parks and Recreations uh, committee meeting. That everybody was very jovial and very happy that they're going to get vaccinated. And I guess I supposed to share in that happiness, but um, the because the PRNS can't really fully uh, uh, meet the need that is in the community, that is going to leave it to the nonprofits to be able to um, to support that which the PRNS uh, doesn't do. Um, at Conexion, there's three different programs. There's Bright Futures, there's Reset that deals with uh, justice impacted youth, 18 to 24, and then there's Project New Hope. And so these three programs deal with this population that is eventually going to start aging out because what COVID has done is created a vacuum in the community. 
these these kids are really disconnected from from society from the infrastructure uh, not the infrastructure but the institutions because they experience and they know hey we've been dogged out and we've been neglected we've been rejected and this is how they process it and what the gangs do and what the streets do and say, hey, well, come on, homie, we got love for you. No, don't even trip. We got you. And they are the ones that fill that vacuum. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of working partnerships between organizations like Somos, organizations like uh, Si Si Puedes Collective, and also organizations like Conexión. I've actually been very surprised that there hasn't been enough advocacy and cooperation between the city and Conexión, considering what it does and it's been an operation for 44 years doing this type of work and still going. Thank you. And we also have Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, for this item, um, I, I guess I just wanted to thank yourselves for, uh, you know, it sounds like you're trying to work with low income people, uh, possibly, and with uh, um, grant issues in this time of COVID, possibly, it sounds like. And um, I think that's interesting subject matter. Uh, I think, you know, I was very interested in uh, Councilperson uh, Carrasco's previous comments to, to treat the digital divide issues as a, as a memorial. And I, you know, to, to find, abstract terms to talk about, you know, our COVID condition and put that in a focused framework is uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to do. And I try to do that too. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I honestly feel, you know, just to try to offer again that, uh, you know, this era of COVID is not really the fault of everyday people. And I don't, I, I, we have to learn, we're trying to learn important lessons that we, we should not have to be held to its debt burden that's being placed upon us. And, and the fact that we can help out low-income neighborhoods and, and people can receive help and, you know, they don't have to be forced to pay rent at this time. And there's really good programs in place that can help really pay for the entire system, basically that's foreign to us and that's not fully acceptable to us yet. And we're learning that we don't, we can do that and not, and not hurt each other. And that takes a lot to learn. And so, you know, it's, it's a tough time. And thank you for a program like this to just simply offer help. There's always just help needed at this time. And that has to be a driving force in how we think of things at this time. What helps us? What do we do to not hurt? Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to my colleagues and I see uh, Council Member Carrasco. Sorry about that. Oh, now you can see my little hand. I didn't have it raised for this for this one. Oh, it must have been from the last item. Thank Council you. Member I, I, I just actually wanted to acknowledge uh, something that one of the speakers mentioned, and that is um, vaccinating our emergency workers who are also PRNS employees. That is a good thing. We want them vaccinated. We want them safe, and we have had um, some units or groups that have experienced COVID, even though overall as a city, um, the numbers aren't large citywide. We have had a number of people out working during this pandemic who um, can and should be vaccinated as emergency workers. Um, I'll just share that as an elected official myself who does not fall into one of the existing categories, um, I'm not um, vaccinated yet. And that's not to shame anybody who meets one of the categories and, and should be vaccinated. But um, I really am hesitant to politicize vaccinating our PRNS workers. Um, they should be, um, and I hope they continue to get vaccinated. I know that 
Um, it's a little crazy right now in terms of moving things around in the state and Blue Shield and the county. Um, but for our workers who have been out in the field who have not been vaccinated yet, um, I hope that they do. Thanks. I agree with you, Councilmember Esparza. Um, we want to make sure that they all stay healthy as they keep um, keep a smile on our face uh, through so many different uh, support services. Um, and I know one of the greatest things that they did this last year was uh, making sure that families had uh, care for their children through our distance learning and, uh, and their um, rock program rock and learn uh, program. So thank you for, for that. And thank you for, for all the really great work. I always um, have endless compliments for, for all of you um, because I know you're, you're the, you and the library are really the heart of, uh, of the city um, because you interact with our, our folks so much. The questions I have are about um, tracking the hours at PRNS um, staff perform during COVID response. Uh, can you share what that number of hours um, for the PRNS staff? I mean, you may not have it right off the cuff here, but maybe offline if you could uh, provide that, John. Yeah, maybe if I can get clarification, Councilmember, you think are you are you wanting like hours per week or like how many hours total they've worked since total. The we began yeah. kind of a thing yeah. like last year? Yeah. All on pandemic stuff, I'm assuming, right? On pandemic stuff, yeah. And, and you know, whether it, it's getting paid for in general fund dollars or or through FEMA or CARES reimbursement, um, you, you know, kind of just doing a little bit of, of the math on, on FEMA reimbursement sure. uh, to see what the PRNS's COVID response yeah. work was. And then um, I really love the message of uh, PRNS is essential. And I have... Um, uh, have said that, um, not that I've coined it, but I have said that um, when we hit uh, difficult times, we tend to look at the PRNS department as a department to really cut budget. Uh, and um, as you can see, and I think people, our community can, can see that you are absolutely essential and not the first department that should get cut, if anything. Um, you should be the last um, as our community relies on uh, cost uh, uh, or free services. And right now um, you don't have cost recovery uh, programming. Um, all of your programming is basically free to our, our community who needs it. And so um, I would love to see this um, stay beyond um, this pandemic. And so I was hoping you could share with me a little bit about your work plan item to um, move past this, uh, you know, the challenges in the recovery model. Um, if you could tell me how, how, how do we plan to make sure that this, that, uh, that PRNS is essential um, and not a cost recovery um, department? Sure. Thank you. Um, the so next month in April, we have a conversation we're bringing to you about um, a lot of this type of programming and sort of what it costs to scale and do more of or what it costs to subsidize. Um, you know, we're trying to get a little extra money for scholarships um, to uh, offset costs in the upcoming year. We're, we'll probably be greatly helped with that with the, uh, the latest uh, federal money and state money. Uh, I believe the federal bill should be signed tomorrow. So that'll help at least in the shorter term. And in the longer term, I think as you're aware, you know, we are examining a ballot measure. We are looking at that as a potential source of ongoing programmatic revenue, separate from a bond where you would borrow money to build stuff. This is more about the programming side, um, you know, the do stuff, right? Um, and so, so we'd be looking at a lot of those vulnerable population programs from seniors to young kids in preschool, to after school programs, teen programs, those kind of things that we know keep the kids off the street, they keep them around positive adults and hopefully keep them out of getting into some trouble um, and keep them in school. So, um, so more to come on that as we work that plan out, but that would, the goal would be right now, 2022 ballot. Um, so that's what we're beginning to work towards. Uh, we have about a year and a half or so before that happens. So. Uh, more to come. We will definitely share that plan um, as we iron it out. 
Perfect. And then just offline, if we can get some of that information. Um, and then I'll have uh, my team reach out to you, um, John, for, for some of that. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you for um, uh, uh, pivoting with the pandemic and this, this uh, theme of PRNS is essential. Um, I absolutely agree uh, with it. And so we, we got to put um, our money where their mouth is, right? All right, do I get do I have a motion? Move to approve. I will second it. Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Yes. Ms. Barza? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Moving right along. So now we have Project Hope annual report and 2020 to 2021 Project Hope Expansion Status Update. This is item D4 for those of you who are following us at home. Good afternoon, Council Member Arenas. Can we please have uh, access to the screen uh, for Israel Kanhura, who will actually be leading today's presentation? I, I have it, Mario. Oh. Absolutely. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Perfect. Well, good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Mario Maciel, and I'm the division manager overseeing Project Hope and our city's youth intervention unit. Uh, presenting with me today uh, and leading today's effort is Israel Kanhura, our superintendent for Project Hope and Youth Intervention Services. Next slide, Isa. We wanted to first thank the council for the amazing opportunity to work to work so closely with our most vulnerable communities. This is some of the toughest yet most rewarding work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We also want to be clear that our work is extremely relational and thus will always be anchored in equity, trust, di dignity, and respect. These are the communities that Mr. Soto has talked about being redlined and historical traumas that they've endured. So uh, the fact that it's relational and the fact that we are always going to be dignifying our communities and respecting them um, is, is something that we will always aim for our work in. Uh, let me now pass it over to Israel Kanhura, who's going to help us through this Project Hope update for you all. Uh, thank you, Mario, and thank you, uh, council members, as well as the committee members uh, for this opportunity. I first want to talk about the outcomes of uh, Project Hope. Uh, our first one is to develop sustainable organized groups of community um, through the um, implementation of uh, neighborhood associations in those uh, Project Hope areas. Um, secondly, is to um, support the safer, cleaner environments in our communities. Um, thirdly, inform, uh, create, uh, inform residents who can access city services. And lastly, to um, assist in the development of partnerships that can assist our Project Hope neighborhoods into um, sustainability. I wanna talk briefly about the, um, our model in terms of um, the community engagement. We do this in five phases. And as we move through these phases, we are always with our community um, in, in terms of um, working with them, training them as they move through each and every one of these phases. They are never alone, even in the sustainability mode we are always there uh, supporting our communities. Um, the next slide talks about our impact in regards to um, COVID and the limitations and the pivots that we've had to make in order to ensure that, our, that we continue to serve our neighborhood associations as well as our Project Hope neighborhoods. So when and there were no in-person um, um, meetings that we could have, we quickly move into um, Zoom meetings with our neighborhood associations. We've hosted over 129 meetings to date. Um, in terms of um, when we noticed that there was a lack of internet access in our community, we quickly moved to um, uh, have digital connectivity events in those neighborhoods and to link up our residents to, um, to the new um, uh, era into having um, internet access in their homes for their kids. Um, when we actually understood that our residents could not log into um, Zoom meetings because they couldn't actually like um, uh, use uh, Zoom. We actually created three videos in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese to actually like help our communities log on to our Zoom meetings. 
Um, we also had some um, uh, directives from the EOC that also um, uh, we had to also pivot and stop some of the work that we were doing in our Project Hope communities. Um, one was to um, the census work. For a whole month, our team knocked on, I think approximately 32,000 um, doors and we helped the city actually like gain so much attention for the work, for, the, for our efforts. Um, and I was really, I'm really proud of my team. I mean, this doesn't happen, this work doesn't happen by itself. It takes a whole lot of dedicated, um, again, PRNS staff to do this work. And not, uh, I commend my staff for doing that. And then we, we shifted to, uh, to the next part was that food distribution, uh, where we provided over 226,000 meals to San Jose residents. And those were you know, in the east side, primarily in the east side of San Jose. I think that uh, we have to remember that during the pandemic, so many kids and families were out of work and needed food and our staff stepped up to the plate and actually provided all those resources and services. So again, youth intervention services and Project Hope were at the forefront of this effort. Now I wanna show you where we are today in terms of like where Project Hope is, uh, all the neighborhoods and um, just briefly touch base on that and, um, and take you through this. But um, Cadillac, Winchester, Roundtable and Welsh they're really on, on their way. You know, they have um, established boards for the last three years and they're in the sustainability phase. However, we're still supporting them, go, uh, you know, in the events that they do, in the Zoom meetings that they have. Um, Hoffman, Pokeway, and Santee, currently they're in the mobilization phase. And again, that has been a stop and start start from the very beginning due to COVID. And so we're expecting to have full boards um, in those three areas by, uh, by July. We have a plan for that. Um, Genie, Washington, and Foxdale, those are really, um, right now, they're at the very beginning of, of, of starting due to the fact that we have uh, staff, uh, one staff member uh, for that site. We're trying to like get two more CAWs to support that staff member in order to like fully begin the implementation phase of those three sites. And uh, we hope to be in the mobilization phase by July. I wanted to, uh, I wanted, before I, I, I go on this, I wanted to remind us that um, the first four sites, uh, Cadillac, Roundtable, Welsh, and Hoffman, were, um, were sites that were chosen through directives of consul. And the other five sites were through an equity screen that we, that we developed. Again, you know, throughout this whole process, we are learning along the way, and we're learning about some of the things that uh, make this work um, effective, and sometimes, you know, the challenges. And we, all, uh, we know that this work is relational um, and is anchored in um, equity, respect, and trust in our communities. The work is cyclical, meaning that, you know, again, when our, 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 when our communities, um, our boards, get into the, uh, the sustainability phase, we never actually leave our communities. We're always there with them, um, helping them and assisting them, them along the way. Um, and at the same time, and the last uh, point I wanna make here is that we have so many different partners from um, housing to code enforcement um, to SJPD um, that are helping us in, in these communities. And they too um, have not been um, funded to do this work, but they're there uh, beside us uh, all the time. And I really commend their effort. Um, this is Project Hope uh, Communities in Action. These are some of the events that, um, some of the pictures of the events that we've held with our community um, throughout this time. And um, before I move forward with playing the video, I wanted to uh, pause for a second and ask, um, the chair, if I could actually play the video, or do we have do we go into uh, uh, public comments? If you have a favorite part, Israel, of the video, I would say play that that piece. Okay. Um, we do want to get a, a bit of a sense uh, of it, but I think most of us are we we, we recognize Project Hope in our own respective backyards. <laughs> okay, so I'll play for a little bit, and then I'll pause it, and then we can go into um, 
public comment. Project Hope is a community empowerment initiative aimed at making sure that our most marginalized and needed community is, are empowered and ready to advocate for themselves. Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Walsh Park Neighborhood Association meeting. My name is Denisa Cho, and I'm the president. I want us to come together so our voice is stronger and that wherever we go to, they hear us. Because if it's just one individual or five, it's not the same as all of us coming together and really voicing our needs. Because basically, I live in this type of communities. And I feel that we can make a change. It's just believing in people that want to lead and then joining them. Because what we do is uncommon, it's unusual. It's, it's neighborhood organizing, it's, it's mobilizing folks to uh, see themselves as agents of change. It was gonna take every single department, every program within the city to truly focus on these communities if we really wanna make a change. This is actually what makes Project Hope successful, I think, is that um, we're working together they're really their primary focus is to go and engage the community. So he is going to be overseeing both Hawking Diamante, Project Area, and Rotor Roundtable. Israel, I think there's a delay with the video. So I think we could naturally just find a pause here. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we won't get to see Council Member Jimenez's great part in there. Uh, Chappie Jones and all of the great, but we sent it out to you all. Hopefully you can oh, take good. a look at it. It's a very powerful video that really kind of captures the the passion that's needed to be able to work within these communities and, and how rewarding it is to see them empower themselves, Council Member Aranas. Yes, right, I, I, absolutely. Can you make one last point? Oh, uh, of I course. Forgot, yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I forgot to, make it to really like, uh, you know, hit, uh, hit something that, that I, just took a look at the fact that we were having issues with the video and i forgot to like mention that you know through this process we also noticed that our our neighborhood associations were struggling with um with uh, with running their meetings online and so we purchased 27 surface pros for each uh, three for each of those uh, neighborhood uh, neighborhoods and um we've already distributed the first ones to the currently active board so I just wanted to mention that before we moved on. Thank you, Israel. Thank you. And how, how many did you say those were 27 and you just Yeah, we three, have um, each one. Yeah. The, the hope are council active boards. Yeah. The hopes are to have three per the nine areas that have been funded, council member. Um, yeah. We know that our board sometimes are up to five individuals. Uh, we had limited resources and thought it'd be a good start, but as we get next year's al allocation of budget, maybe we can increase that to the full board. Yeah, Maria, I'm really confused because I, I would think, you know, we'll hear from our, our community first, but I would love for us, uh, for these community associations to take advantage of uh, the, the digital inclusion um, efforts and the devices and hotspots that are offered through there. But I'm gonna first uh, go to our, our community, hear them first, and then we'll move on to our colleagues. All right, go ahead, Mr. Soto. Uh, 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 thank you, Councilwoman Renas. Uh, Mario, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I, I can tell that you 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 get it. In, in terms of the way that we were raised here in Samho. And I'm, I'm having discussions with, with uh, officials in law enforcement at the, at the highest levels of law enforcement. Um, I've met Captain McFadden. I've met Captain uh, 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 Paul Joseph, who is a, a constant attendee at the Guana, which is the Guadalupe Washington uh, Neighborhood Association. I'm having conversations with RCD, the developer that is going to be moving into the horseshoe. And so I'm a t in attendance, and I also um, volunteer at Conexion. I give out food to the most impacted in, in uh, Councilwoman uh, Esparza's district. 
You know, I, I, I pass out food. I, I do a lot of volunteer work there, all volunteer. I get paid not one dime from anybody at all, ever. And so um, the frustrating part for me is that I have this body of knowledge and experience, and I'd, I'd really like to expand it. And so I'm hoping that uh, I can work with, since Conexion is in Council Woman Esparza's district, if that we can work together on expanding the scope, because I'm looking here, and Conexion is not any of the organizations that is being uh, 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 allocated any kind of funding that and yet we deal with these these targeted groups and there are bright futures deals with impacted youth they have us like a school here where they deal with not only the the educational piece but a lot of the social issues that kids uh aging out of the foster care system or in the foster care system or or, or cps are affected and so really just like some help here thank you thank you uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Sorry, I ended in my last public comment a little strong, uh, but it, I was honest about it and I'm hopeful about it. I mean it in totally good terms that, uh, you know, I feel there's a way that we can organize ourselves. Uh, you know, there's so much weird energy going on with all the COVID stuff that I, I feel there's a way we can harness that weird energy through local government basically and and make some pretty strong demands of uh you know our national and international level and it'd be interesting how local government and community can work together to towards such efforts and to ask to end you know certain practices at the national and international level and uh you know to do that is, uh, is a real effort, and, and so I just wanted to mention here that we do have the possibilities to do that at this time. And this item is a great example of, you know, just simply addressing community and how they can find ways to participate in, in the government community process. And that's a big step one. I mean, giving, giving uh, you know, everyday people those tools to do that, uh, it's important. I have, I now have those tools. Uh, you know, I can uh, ask about open public policy practices and ideas. And I used to not be able to have that or to be able to do that. And, um, you know, it helps. And just to have a service, you know, you're providing a service with this item that a way that uh, everyday community can really connect to, the, to its government. And that's so important for our future. I mean, it's, it is about openness and communication. And, uh, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful about this item. This is a really good item. And uh, so good luck in how it can just invite a lot of different people. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. I'm going to go back to our um, colleagues and let me see. I don't see anybody. Okay. I think there's Here. more speakers. Yeah. Oh, I apologize yeah. about that. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not see that. Um, uh, Miss Vel uh, Melissa Vargas. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming to the Council Women for the Association. Um, and I want to start by saying that we are very grateful in our community for Project Hope. Uh, Project Hope has helped to make a big difference in our neighborhood. They have helped strengthen our association and have helped our community together. Our neighborhood feels safer and there is more trust uh, within our community towards law enforcement. They have helped us become aware of many important city services and resources that we were not aware of before. Again, I cannot express how grateful we are for Project Hope. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, Eddie Juarez. Hello, committee. My name is uh, Eddie Juarez. I'm vice president of the Welch Park Neighborhood Association. And I just want to talk a little bit about what the Project Hope program has had, the positive impact they've had in our neighborhood. Um, so since Project Hope um, helped us uh, build the neighborhood association, we've been able to conduct monthly meetings 
um, we've been able to do uh, monthly litter pickups and we were able to get a dog park and speed bumps in our neighborhood. This was all thanks to the help of Project Hope. Um, I think without them, uh, we might not have been able to uh, get all these things and achieve what we've had. Um, since Project Hope um, has helped us with a lot of things, uh, we have seen more um, more residents uh, being active and all in all we've seen uh, a safer neighbor neighborhood. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Um, I think it's Maria Ines Ortega. Go ahead and unmute yourself and you can begin speaking. I'm gonna see if maybe it's in Spanish. Uh, si ustedes, Maria Ines Ortega, pueden empezar sus comentarios. Hi, sí, muy buenas tardes. Sí, me buenas escucha? tardes. Sí, sí lo escuchamos. Buenas sí, tardes. Sí, muy buenas tardes. Sí, Men, mi nombre es María Inés Ortega, soy copresidenta de Proyecto Hope y Cadilla Winchester. Y les agradezco de corazón por haber creado este proyecto. A Grace, Happy, a señor Mario, señor Río. Estoy muy agradecida en todos los cambios que ha habido en mi comunidad. Cuando empezamos nuestro grupo, la seguridad era muy difícil en mis calles. Gracias por darnos la oportunidad de tener vigilante nuestra comunidad, nuestros, nuestras calles limpias, becas que nos han aprobado. Les hablo con el corazón, no nos dejen en el olvido que Proyecto Hope siga creciendo. Mis hijos son mi fuerza para ser el ejemplo para más padres y para más comunidades. Ellos siempre están conmigo, tanto en limpiezas, al pendiente de repartir flyers en cada proyecto. Solamente les digo, no quiten los recursos para que nuestra comunidad siga vigilada, nuestros oficiales tengan los recursos. Nuestras comunidades necesitan estar a salvo de pandillas, graffiti, balazos que hay muy seguido. Sin nuestros oficiales no podemos hacer nada. Proyecto Hope es nuestro corazón, nuestra fuerza para seguir adelante, para mantener una, una comunidad unida y segura. Les agradezco por darme esta oportunidad de seguir en Proyecto Job. Muchas gracias. Um, and the last person is uh, Carolina Castillo Solano. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and begin um, your comments. Um, hello, uh, my name is Carolina Castillo. Um, I'm 14 years old and um, I represent Roundtable and San Jose Work. I am a Project Hope intern and a volunteer. Um, some, uh, some stuff that the Project Hope program has made a difference in my neighborhood and in my life in general is giving me an opportunity to um, help out my family in, in the programs that they provide. Um, and then another thing is a cleaner environment since um, our program is aimed at improving the standard of our community. And I feel like this program has really brought like my neighborhood, the people that live in it, um, close as a family and everyone's voice is heard. Um, everybody's opinion is considered and um, everybody just participates in, um, especially in the meetings that we have um, every 30 days as it was mentioned. Um, and it's also um, provided like students um, that are in high school, uh, high school um, for community hours as well. So if they need community hours, they could just go over there and just help us out. And yeah. Well, thank you so much, Carolina, for joining us. Um, I believe that is the last 
speaker. So I will now go back to our um, council members. Uh, council member Sparta. Thank you. So the, the report states that um, the department continues to make progress and is ready to engage three more areas. Um, can you explain how you think Project Hope is ready to take on three new areas? What's the, what's the plan for doing that, given the vacancies that we have? Santee is very much behind, right? Um, and there, we have a lot of vacancies. We haven't been able to hire. Um, how, how, what's the plan to actually do that? Council Member, as far as a, uh, it's definitely been a humongous challenge. Uh, there's been periods of time where we've had all staff hired and then due to promotional opportunities and transitional opportunities, we've lost them. But most currently, uh, we released a polling letter within the department to see if we couldn't get a, a an, an acting coordinator so that we could launch into the last three areas, two being in Council Member Perales's uh, district in Council 3 and the third being in council member Magdalena Carrasco's district. Uh, we believe that if with the funding that we have in place and, and the team that we're assembling that we could begin the process, no doubt it, it's gonna be a struggle. Some of these areas have historical trauma and uh, we're former NSU sites for, from probation uh, that we'll have to come in and, and, and see where we're at. Uh, but without a doubt, you all funded us uh, to move into those areas. Uh, we believe that we finally have gotten to the point where we can consider uh, broaching a relationship. We've been very cautious because as we've stated, this is relational and the last thing we wanna do is create expectations and come up short. And I guess that's why we've hesitated to get started. Uh, before we do get started, I will assure you that we will have a, an in-depth conversation with council member Carrasco and Perales about our limitations and the realities of even the one-time funding for those last three areas uh, that needs to be resolved if we're truly going to enter. But my team is poised, created a timeline, and if all goes well, and if it is the uh, desire of council to continue the funding, we will definitely be launching in the next month or two into those areas. Sure. I mean, I had a timeline and a plan, none of which was met before COVID, right? right. So, so I've experienced that. And, and that's what I'm trying to get at is, again, you know, to be, to have those candid conversations about what our capabilities are. Um, as you stated earlier, we're moving into the Project Hope areas that are based on data, um, that are based on the level of need. lot that the, these neighborhoods are dealing with and there are neighborhoods that just speaking for you know the ones I'm familiar with they need that consistency yeah. um, that I you know I, I haven't seen as much and, and so I worry for for Washington I worry for Foxdale in addition to my own area which is Santee to keep moving ahead and not have the revolving door or the stop and starts um, and so that's why I'm asking, how many vacancies do we have right now? We are holding up on clearance from the budget office on the two last community activity workers. Your site, council member, as soon as we have- Well, I, I, but can you answer? So we have two oh. vacancies, is that? Yes, okay, two so right now there's, is, does that include Sochi? No, ma'am. She's so a we community have three. coordinator. Well, okay. Okay, so we really have three vacancies. And what's the deadline to, to fill those through? You mentioned you were sending out letters to try and get the build that interest. When is that completed? We, we have made the selection for the acting community coordinator. We have okay. had interviews for the community activity workers and we are simply waiting for budget office approval to move forward with the offers. Um, once that team is assembled, it will then take on the other three. There'll be no revolving door with the first six sites. They have dedicated teams that are ongoing funding, and there should be no more glitches as far as continuity, council member, as far as a, our team in your area okay. is solid. All right, thank you. That's it for me. Okay. Uh, okay. Chair, while we're, I wanted to just make a quick point because it's just come up a couple of times, so I just wanted to clarify. 
um, uh, Mr. Soto's uh, interest in Connexion and in our and having a relationship with them. We do. Um, they are one of our funded best providers. Um, and in fact, the next report after this on the agenda is about best in youth intervention. So you, you get that annual report. But just to clarify, we do have a relationship where we help fund them. Um, they do a lot of work with us and for us in the community. So just FYI. Perfect. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the questions I have. Um, uh, seeing that there's no other um, hands raised, so one of my question the the question I have and uh, it's what I uh, mentioned earlier. Why is it that we um, that Project Hope isn't taking advantage of the digital um, uh, inclusion efforts? There, there was plenty of devices that were distributed to even CBOs. Um, you know, I would think that our neighborhood associations could receive more than than just three, right? Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't we get that? Absolutely, Council Member Arenas, and we plan to continue using that resource because we know that it is more than just our board members that need assistance. Um, the reason we wanted to secure these devices for our board members was for the continuity of use, that there would be no turning it in and turning it back. Some of our board members are hopefully going to be board members for a few years with us. So we wanted to give them a device that they could keep for a longer extended period of time. The other variable was the non-personal uh, opportunity. The funding that was available to us this year may not be in future years uh, due to the limitation of activities that we could host in person. Uh, the allocation of non-personal created this opportunity also in this one particular year. But you're absolutely right. For the rest of our association members, for the rest of the community, we will continue to support the digital uh, resources that we have. Right. Well, some some of these neighborhoods are are part of. When I think about the hardest to reach community, this is it. And you know, I was looking at our at the Welch Community Center meeting um, in that video, and you know, these are the folks that we we started with. Um, you know, four years ago, um, and I'll tell you that that um, it, there was there's a lot of support that that is provided to to our neighborhood associations. But sometimes I think we forget that they, uh, even though we've propped them up or we've uh, we've uh, guided uh, them through a process, and they are now uh, standing on their own and leading their meetings and just being very effective as community leaders, that they continue to need these services um, like like the computers. I mean, I, I hope that we can maybe connect with the library and have them also consider them just like the students that must have them year long or at a year long checkout um, because these meetings are happening every month. And, and not only are they happening every month, they are part of that hard to reach and they understand who else needs those. So. I, I really like to, to see um, a, a more of a concerted effort to represent the need of our neighborhood associations for, for digital devices and hotspots so that we can express that to the library and, and hopefully secure um, additional, additional um, devices and hotspots. Um, would we be able to do that, Mario? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that support, Council Member Arenas. Um, you know, we've seen, we're asking so much of these community residents to step up to the table and many come from communities that are financially distressed. And we saw many of our board members struggling to even uh, step up to the task because of the digital divide. And uh, just mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, the mayor was having a check-in with many of our project of communities on a, on a, a gun ordinance uh, or, or tax that he was proposing. And we saw many of our Project Hope board members struggling to even check in because of audio dysfunction or using an old desktop on their computer. So we just felt in the spirit of true partnership that we could do this at this point, but right. to the extent we can further this and make it a more comprehensive approach, uh, you have yeah. our opinion, so uh, council member that ends. Yeah, no, I, I would hate for us to, um, to, to lose some of the traction that has been uh, potentially made in, in some of these different neighborhoods. So um, maybe Angel, if you can help facilitate that, um, that and connect that. 
Yeah, council member, and, and just so you know, that's already in progress. So uh, um, with the digital inclusion board, you know, we had the 1 million going out to 23 grants for all the spots, and then we've identified the other 5,600. PRNS is actually a grantee. They received a small grant in round one. What we've added are the Project Hope Neighborhood Association sites on our prospect list for round two. So that's already in the uh, pipeline. Now we just got to figure out how to operationalize it and how to how to make it happen. But just so you know, it's already on the list for round two. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and uh, and you know, you mentioned Mario that there's some. Um, you, that uh, some of the members themselves are struggling economically, and I and I have to say that for my uh, for Welch Community um, and Neighborhood Association, I hi the, not not Leticia, she's the newer um, neighborhood uh, president, but the former uh, neighborhood president. I hired her in my office for a year, so that she can continue her work at Welch um, because it you know it was she she needed to make a living and she had just lost her job and and she was very effective in our neighborhood association and um and i think th this one of the reasons why i think our neighborhood association is so uh it was able to move through that transition we also had somebody very wonderful um who i think you 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 now um are are able to tout and that's Sid. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm really, uh, really proud of the work that she's doing with Project Hope. She's got the heart, she's got the smarts, and I know that she's going to continue to help our, our neighborhood uh, neighborhoods. But what we really need is we need resources, um, because I hear the, the frustration about, you know, um, having staff change um, and, you uh, and, and, you know, our neighborhood associations sometimes need that stability, right? They need to see the same person. You've built the trust with that person. It doesn't necessarily translate to the new one, right? Whoever is in you in, in that position, we, we hope we, we could, but, but it, not necessarily. It's a whole new relationship and a whole new cycle that needs to get established. And that time gets uh, a bit lost, right? So, um, so I, I, I you know, there's one thing that I had suggested, I think, I don't know, maybe uh, last budget cycle of the year before, I'll propose it again this, uh, well, I'll propose it more formally in this upcoming budget cycle, and that's to really integrate um, uh, promotoras into Project Hope, because um, a, a skeleton crew, I'll say a skeleton crew because it's only three people in a team can't really do the work to mobilize a whole neighborhood. It just isn't possible. Uh, and so I had I had two people assigned two people on on uh, on the city council's uh, personnel co cost uh, assigned to Welch community, so that we can make sure that it was successful, right? And um, not every council district can do that, right? Um, and, and not every council uh, uh, district uh, maybe has the, the 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 resources in their in their budget to to be able to do that. We had just some budget savings, and so we were, were we can't continue to do that. It's not sustainable for us. But but the point here is that we really need um, a, a form of a promotoras uh, component into Project Hope, so that. Um, those relationships can continue and can be um, really from the neighborhood and um, and not a PRNS necessarily a staff member, right? They're going to continue to live in their neighborhoods and represent and be there. Um, so, so I, I, you know, we can talk offline, Angel. I know that I, I think you were also very invested in this in this model, and I. I I just think it's time for us to move yeah. um, into this. Yeah, no, and council member, uh, it, you know, I, I, I think you're spot on. And, and I think this is also where council member Esparza was, what, what she was getting at too. I, I do want to make sure, and I, and I think it's important not to sugarcoat this, running this program is really tough and and it's, it's tough even without a pandemic, right? So it's even tougher right. in this. But the other issue we have is this, and that is that I think we also need to ask the question, you know, how do we right size this program? Because we're going into very stressed communities as has been mentioned by several people already. Um, and uh, although there's four overarching goals, you know, or, or areas of focus, what we're finding is that really the need is so great that 
that there's more than four goals that the community wants to address, right? So we're going in there focusing on, on, on safe and cleaner, informed residents, partnering, you know, um, but there's so many more needs. So, so right now, I think we need to ask ourselves, th is this model resourced sufficiently to really meet the true demand that the community and expectation that the community has? And, and I think the answer to that question will help shape a different model which should include, uh, and I would agree, for example, the use of promotoras, for example, a as a way to get this work done. So uh, uh, staff, I know, I know John and the team are looking at that. We are, we are working on it. Uh, you know, this is a very difficult um, uh, model to implement. Back in the SNI days, money wasn't the issue, so you could staff it as we needed it. We're not in those days, unfortunately, but yet the need has doubled and tripled, uh, you know, back to Councilmember Carrasco's points earlier with, with the other issue. And so I, I do think we need to pause a little bit here and really ask ourselves, what is, how do we really need to structure this program in order for it to be successful? Because right now, PRNS is leaning forward in a big way and all the other partners, but they are, uh, they're struggling and uh, we're, we're struggling, right? And so uh, I just want to kind of put that, put that out there. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna answer that question. It is not right-sized, yeah. um, but I know that you're gonna do uh, more analysis than that. The last question I have is about the surveys that were conducted. Um, I, I'd love to see some of those uh, preliminary uh, uh, answers um, and concerns, uh, especially, you know, around my area. Uh, of course, I'm sure that each council member would want their own. Um, just to see what what uh, what those community members are, are thinking. Um, so, and the last thing um, that that is it. But I, I do want to say a thank you to PRNS once again. Um, we just uh, did a ribbon cutting for our dog park. We 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 started four years ago um, with a, a visioning uh, event um, that helped define some of the features that our neighborhood wanted. And I was really surprised to, to see that it was um, dog park uh, features. And so we have uh, a, now a dog park at Welch small for small uh, dogs and large dogs. And it's just absolutely fabulous. Um, this is part of, you know, this is part of the work bef be even before project hope you know uh this is our neighborhood association who was who was uh putting this forward but i know that um when project hope came on board you know uh they were able to also bring in uh folks into the fold and and so i want to continue to learn what what our needs are for for our residents um i know project hope is really close to um the welch community and um, so but i want to thank you uh for the support that you've provided through the years um and um and please uh, if you have a little furry one, uh, Council Member Carrasco, I know she's got like a dozen. <laughs> visit our Welch, our <laughs> visit our doggy park. It is absolutely right. fabulous. All right, I'll stop my promotion. Council Member Carrasco, is that a, still a raised hand, uh, Council Member Carrasco? I was, I was trying to show you my little hand is raised right there. Oh no, your hand is on the other side, uh, council member. Can you see it? No, it's it, if you lean on to the other side, that's where your hand is. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Now your hand okay. is on your head. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going like that uh, until I change the 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 color of it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, oh, it's nice. It's nice that you have a little uh, dog park because I was just being asked by someone. Uh, uh, there was a request for more uh, doggy parks. So I'm gonna actually get on the phone when I'm done here and let them know. And they live just around the corner from Welch actually. So it'll be a nice little trek over there. Uh, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, so one is um, uh, administratively. I wanted to just clarify because I was, uh, uh, I, I was actually, I was letting the fruit lady from the corner in to go to the bathroom. So I stepped away for just a second. Uh, did you say that there was two vacancies or three vacancies? I thought there was two vacancies. I thought we've been talking about two vacancies this whole entire time. There are only two vacancies and there is already a, a, a third coordinator already selected council member. So there is only two permanent vacancies. We cannot move on a permanent coordinator until the 
higher class opportunity for Sochi Liz Remedy. But there isn't two empty spots. We have a person in place. We're just simply missing our two community activity workers to be at full strength to be able to move into Foxdale, Jeannie, and Washington. So, so there's two bodies that are missing. Yeah, both community activity workers, both have already been interviewed and it's just a matter of time for the budget office to release uh, the funding and allow us to, to hire them. In. We've been working closely with them. So I imagine any times we actually thought we would have already had the news. Uh, we've been in close communication pressing because we know how important it is to get started, council member. Yeah. So, so, and, and, uh, and I wanted to, to get some clarity around that. Uh, because of course, uh, and I know that, well, the, here's a couple of things that I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I kind of know, but I don't know. I'm like, I, I think that I understand it and I get my head wrapped around it. And then I go, and now I, I'm confused about it. Like, this is very specialized work. Uh, I don't make any any qualms about this. I don't think that just anyone off the street can go ahead and do this. Uh, I, I I grew up, you know, I basically grew up uh, doing social work and doing very, uh, I would say, very specialized almost kind of work. You know, uh, when when I decided to get into the work of um, of uh, supporting my community. It, it wasn't, um, you know, I didn't go into private practice. I didn't hang up a nice little placard out uh, at, at, in an awning and, uh, and, and uh, start seeing couples and uh, doing private practice. I went out into the community where, you know, I had to be very flexible and I was doing the kind of work where sometimes I was sitting on the floor, sometimes I was going out into the fields uh, of Santa Barbara uh, or the orchards, uh, in the avocado orchards, truly, you know, or sometimes, you know, the parents were, were, were the nannies of some of the wealthiest families in Santa Barbara, not wealthy, like this was old money while they left their eight-year-olds completely unattended. And then I would get there and I would do work with them on an old swing that was just strung up in an old you know, uh, tree that was dying in the backyard. That was the work that I was doing. So it, it takes someone that is okay doing that kind of work. And then when I was working with Silvia Henas in first five, I was going into homes with Silvia and, and, and believe it or not, with her now administrative assistant, Alicia Fasal, where I was standing sometimes right next to Alicia. Uh, and Alicia may not even know this because I had to you know, really control myself watching a dozen roaches literally half an inch crawling right behind her head uh, uh, as she was doing assessments with children. And so there, this kind of work, what I'm trying to say to you is sometimes it takes a very special kind of person that's been trained in a very different way. You know, I had to sit at tables, uh, you know, uh, and enjoy a meal with families while I, I, I had, you know, and I, there's only one real thing that I fear and my team members know this and my children know this. And it's, uh, I, I don't fear a lot of things. I don't fear dogs and cats and I don't even fear roaches. I feel mice, fear mice. Uh, and I had to enjoy a meal while I felt a, a mouse running across my feet, you know, and learn how to, you know, uh, just pour salsa on my taco while that was going through my toes, right? Uh, it, it, these are true stories. These are true stories. I, I can write a book about it, um, you know? And so I know, I know that it, you can't just find anyone from the MSW program to come in and do this kind of work. So I guess what I'm getting at is uh, in, in the time of COVID, when people are also struggling to find jobs, can't we find people 
who have this kind of training, who want to, who are passionate, who are out of jobs, who are are really desire desire you know who are really desiring of uh of giving back to our community who have had some sort of training who can connect and who are willing to leave their comfort zone i'm just i'm 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 very mesmerized by the fact that these positions have been empty for so long council members they've uh we, when we recruit for the community coordinator, that is exactly the type of candidate that we insist on finding. Someone that has lived experience, that has the academia behind it, but has the heart and soul to be able to dignify the people that we're trying to help. Uh, in this particular case, when we put out the polling letter, I was a bit caught, uh, worried that we might not find a person with that type of attribute. Um, at the risk of getting ahead of myself, but I don't think I am because the person has been offered the position. The very person Sylvia was talking about, Maria Sid, will be given the opportunity to be that coordinator because she's part of the Project Hope team right now for the past couple of years, Council Member Carrasco, as a community activity worker, has the minimum qualifications, has the experience and passion, is a resident of one of our Project Hope areas herself, and is now going to be afforded this opportunity. So. I'm actually thrilled to see her step into this leadership role. And I think when you get to meet her council member, you're going to see uh, the passion and power that she possesses. Um, okay, well, I, 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 uh, I don't know Maria Sid. Uh, and I, I look forward to meeting her. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, and I don't want to uh, um, rehash uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I guess at this point, all we can do is continue to move forward. Um, but, but I guess what I will say is, you know, we, we have to continue to uh, address whatever is holding us back from moving forward and, and, and move whatever barriers. So one is, as I see it, the barriers that are before our families and our youth and remove those barriers. The other is, are those barriers us? And we have to address that. Are they bureaucratic barriers? Are they administrative barriers? Are they financial barriers? Are they budgetary barriers? Is it the mayor? Is it Magdalena? Is it Sylvia? Tell me if it's Sylvia. Let me get Sylvia out of the way. You know, what is it? Is it Maya Esparza? I, I brought in Maria Sid uh, into the mix, uh, uh, Council Member Carrasco, and you are going to thank me later because she is absolutely fabulous, fabulous. But but I say that I say that half jokingly because you got to tell us what it is because we 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 can't we can't continue to you know to to hold back on some of these, uh, you know, what I think, I, I, and again, I don't pretend to think that you can immediately fill these positions. I, I, I think it's, they're, they're not easy positions to fill because I think it takes a special person. But if it's progress, and excuse me, I, I, I can't seem to get my, my words out as fast as I'd like to, which, is, which might be a really good thing for everybody. <laughs> but, you know, I, what I'm saying is, I want to make sure that we're not getting ourselves in the way of progress. And, and you need to be able to say that. You need to be able to say, hey, I, I just can't do it, or this is what's happening. And you need to be able to say it, and I'll say it as my mother would say, con toda confianza, because at the end of the day, we are all on the same page, I think, which is to save these kids' lives. And these kids are in the most dangerous places. They're just in the most dangerous places. And I can't even pretend to know or understand what that is. What I do know is I have a son and I don't want him there. I don't want him in that place. And I know Mario, you have a son. And I know Angel has a son. And I know Sylvia has a son. And I know John has a son and Israel as well. And I know that none of us want our sons to be in that place. I know we don't, and I know we do everything we can 
that as soon as we see them getting too close to that edge, to that cliff, we grab them from the back of that collar and we yank them as hard as we can. And so what I'm asking you is, what do we need to do to yank these boys, these boys and these girls from the edge of that cliff? Is it filling those positions? Is it changing the program? Do we burn this program down to the ground and we rebuild? Do we move bureaucratic uh, uh, obstacles that are getting in our own way? Is it us that gets in the way of, of yanking these kids from that cliff? Because something is happening. I know that in the past year, the pandemic was a huge, huge obstacle, but it wasn't everything, you guys. It wasn't everything. And so we got to be honest about it. And we got to make sure that it doesn't continue to happen because the budget process is coming up. And before I put my signature on that next memo, or before I write up another memo, another document that says, give these guys more money to produce what? To produce what? You all gotta tell me, what am I producing? What are we producing? I know what I want to produce, but I'm going to ask you based on what. And we can't keep coming back here and saying we didn't produce A, B, and C because of X, Y, and Z. Because if this was your son, Mario, it would be unacceptable. It's unacceptable right now, Council. Okay. And, and that's, that's what I want to hear. It's unacceptable. And if this was my son, I know what I would do to make sure that that kid didn't fall off the edge of that cliff. And I know that sometimes we say, well, as a parent, we'll lay down our lives for the, these kids. Those kids may not be our kids. But, but what I'm asking is that we, we treat it we treat it almost as close as if they were our own children. Maybe they are Comadre's children. So it gets closer. So I want to know what the obstacles are for us to get there so we can actually combat it. Because we can come back here next year and, and have these same results. If I may, this is Andrea for Shelton. Um, I just want to take the spirit of um, what Council Member Carrasco is saying and um, lean in to answer the question. Um, I've been the interim deputy director for just about a year, and um, I've, I've asked the same question as to how can we fund one-time community organizing work? And so we've that has been very challenging um, because it does but um, hiring, um, as you've described, council member, you know, a special, unique person. Um, it's not. It's it's not as attractive as a ongoing position, right? So that sets us up um, in a in a challenging environment. Um, so and it's one time and it's one year, and our hiring processes are what they are. So um, I want to say that directly um, that that is something that does not. Um, does not help us put our best foot forward, and it doesn't get us to um, the goals and outcomes that Mario and Israel have just laid out. So, um, so that's a deep challenge. I also um, am excited, and we want to want to take on sort of how we kind of co-design and think about this promotora model, um, and think about how we use our resources widely because that helps us to expand and do the work and be on the ground consistently. And it helps to set up the roles and responsibilities where the city has strengths and where the community has strengths and how do we put that into a cohesive plan. So um, I take this conversation, I think we all do wholeheartedly, um, but really want to let you know um, ongoing is the, the ongoing funding is 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 the right way to go, but it's still a limited um, group of people to do a lot of work in a lot of neighborhoods with deep, deep um, historic pervasive 
disadvantages that aren't going to be solved, you know, with a, a city program in and of itself. So um, we'll take this on and um, I just wanted to lay that out. I, I, I appreciate that, Andrea. Thank you so much. And you're right. This is, it's systemic. It's, uh, you know, uh, when you look at uh, citywide and, you know, the east side is is densely um, plagued by uh, by many issues, and and this is a, this is a very serious one. Uh, but but let's start by at, at least you know filling in those those positions so that we can at least have an inventory and we can see where the rest of the holes are. And and that's my biggest concern is uh, let's start there. Let's move forward. And let's see what kind of results we can get. And then we can make an assessment. Uh, we can take inventory of what we need and what we, and where we, where, where we pivot. Um, and um, uh, so I'll leave it at there at the, uh, I'll leave it there for now. I see that council. Um, thank you, chair. Council member Esparza. Thanks. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, so thank you, Councilmember Carrasco. Um, I think you're very eloquent and really hit the hit nail on the head. Um, as a teenager, I ran an after-school program and actually a lot more in the Washington neighborhood. Um, and what's interesting is this this hasn't changed, right? Like we talk about crackdown, we talk about SNI. We know the neighborhoods that need love right? It's not, we're not guessing. And so we really need to be honest as a city about what the needs are of these neighborhoods. And that two years ago with my colleagues on this committee and some that aren't, that's why we brought an equity proposal to the city. That's why we fought for equity because it's things like this that creates inequity within our city. And so I, I, and I'll, I'll be happy to say this at the full council dais as well, but programs like Project Hope, programs like BEST, the Mayor's Gang Task Force to me are about equity, about what all of our city deserves and should be funded for. So I know there are a lot of competing um, priorities for attention. And so I'm gonna challenge you, Angel, and I'll be happy to talk offline, but I'm gonna challenge you to look at COVID economic recovery money to fund some of the promotora work because we there's, there's a silver lining to this pandemic that has devastated the East Side. And by the way, all the data shows that immigrant women have paid the heaviest economic price during COVID. And so we do have a path. We just need to be a little bit more creative, but also assertive and demand that we do things differently. Because I am, I agree with Councilmember Carrasco. I don't want to be back here a year ago because pretty much, um, except for the COVID-related items, this was the same presentation as last year, right? It was the same sort of stats about... A, the non-COVID part, we have vacancies, we can't do this, we're behind because we can't fill the positions. It is one-time funding. And I, I just don't wanna be here a year from now because our neighborhoods are suffering and our neighborhoods may actually look a whole lot different a year from now as well. So I'll, in the interest of time, I'll um, leave it there and Angel, I'll be happy to um, coordinate offline. Yeah, no, no, I, I, and I just wanna say challenge accepted. And, and also I appreciate uh, Councilmember Carrasco the way she framed it because you, you asked a very multifaceted, multidimensional question and the answer is just as multidimensional. And, uh, and, and you know, as I was listening to this presentation, I was even having a little bit of regret. And I'm gonna be really, you know, candid here. About a year or two years ago when we were even talking about should we even lean forward and go forward with these uh, uh, one-time funded Project Hope sites, there was something deep inside in me that said, the, the risk you take with doing that is there's this false expectation that you're gonna be able to deliver and meet all the multifaceted needs in the communities that, that really is just setting staff up for failure. And in a lot of ways, that's what we have done. 
And I think we need to also acknowledge that, that, you know, um, you know, so, and, and, you know, and I get it, sometimes you get your hands slapped for leaning forward, but it, it, at that time we thought it was the right thing to do. But I think the questions that you're raising today are very important. We need to frame this issue in the context of what issues are we trying to solve and what will it actually take? What are the multifaceted solutions to solve them? And as long as we all stay connected as a team and not beat each other up in the process, because we, you know, we, we, there can also be a, you know, a tendency to do that, then I think we'll end up with the right thing to do. But I, I say challenge accepted. And I say that on behalf of all our staff too, because I know how committed our staff are and I know how committed you all are as elected officials. And I think we could make something really good out of this. And because at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. This is about how we serve our communities and meet them at their point of need. And so there's no argument there. Uh, challenge accepted. We will, um, we will work on this. Perfect. Um, so it sounds like um, we can get a motion. Uh, mo mo is it to accept the report? Yes. Okay, motion to accept. Second. Perfect. Ruth? Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to move on um, to, we, we still have two more items. Um, and so this is uh, item D5, Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, bringing everyone's strengths together, Safe Summer Initiative Grant and Youth Intervention Programs and Annual Report. And I think we have a presentation. Hi, good afternoon, uh, committee members and chair. I hope you can see the screen here that I'm sharing. Okay. Um, my name is Petra Garo. I am the interim program manager for our department strategic partnership unit. And um, we, along with, well, I, along with our grant management team, we work alongside our partners and we support them to implement services for the Bringing Everyone's Strengths Together and the Safe Summer Initiative grant programs. Um, and I'll present, I'll be presenting today along with Mario Maciel, who is the division manager for our youth intervention services um, and uh, typically in previous years, we've presented, our department has presented on the two grant programs, which are the funding arms of the task force. Um, and this year we'll be presenting um, as youth intervention services along with this report today. And this is the first year that we'll be including youth intervention services. Um, we also have representatives from our evaluation uh, consultant uh, firm, which is social policy research with us today on the panel. Uh, Christian Geckler and Madeline Levin is here, um, and they are the lead authors of our best final evaluation report, uh, which is referenced in our memo that we provided to the committee. Um, and both Youth Intervention Services and the BEST program are currently working with uh, social policy research to evaluate our programs um, and, and to validate really the services that we're putting out there um, and that into the community and that they're making an impact. Um, and we'll also share today that there is more work to do and to continuously improve our efforts um, in providing quality programs. Um, and so I, I wanna turn it now over to Mario. Mario, you're muted. Mario, I'm mute. Mario you're muted. Wow. I'm, uh, what a rookie move there, but let, let me let me start again. Thank you again, Council Member Mario Maciel, Division Manager for Youth Intervention Services. Uh, this is a visual of our larger Mayor's Gang Task Force structure. Um, truly a collective impact approach that includes city, county, faith, school, and our community. Uh, this particular issue of youth and community violence is definitely going to take all of us. Um, and though we have heard from Project Hope this morning, part of our neighborhood services service provision pillar, uh, today uh, we will focus on best and youth intervention particularly. Um, but it would be, I would be remiss not to acknowledge all of our other stakeholders who play such an equally important role in improving the quality of life for our youth and our communities. And that really is our county pockets and our county uh, institutions that so much are part of the equation to success in 
in our Project Hope areas, which are also our again task force hotspot areas. Our kids go to county schools, they get county and social services from the county. They, if they get in trouble, they go to our county probation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a pleasure working with all our county partners on this collective impact. That being said, we are here to focus primarily on these two uh, elements of the Mayor's Gang Task Force. And that is our youth intervention services, which I have the honor to lead and followed by our best and safe summer initiative grants that Petro runs. Um, I know that in the grant, there was a description of each and every one of those programs, uh, but just briefly, obviously our safe school campus initiative is a protocol aimed, it's a communication protocol aimed at diminishing or reducing violence on and around our school campuses. Clean Slate is our tattoo removal program in partnership with Valley Medical Center. San Jose Works is our summer jobs initiative in partnership with the Office of Economic Development. Digital Arts is our kind of our music and video produ production program in partnership with Sonol uh, continu uh, Continuation School out of the Santa Clara County Office of Ed and our Roosevelt Community Center. Our late night gym is held at four of our major hubs throughout the city. Our female intervention team is obviously our gender specific approach to deal with all our young ladies that get released from probation back into our communities. And lastly, our hospital based intervention, which is a state funded initiative uh, leveraged through the gang task force to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity to engage those individuals that have been victims of violence in our city. We are proud to say we are both at Regional Medical Center and Valley Medical Center now. The two grant programs that we'll be focusing on are obviously our, our funding arm of the Mayor's Gang Task Force, San Jose Best, which brings in the expertise and passions of our community-based organizations to assist us in such a challenging collective impact approach again. And lastly, under the last administration, the concept of trying not to lose that summer learning loss and keeping our kids safe during those vulnerable months of idle minds and idle hands, we will be talking about our Safe Summer Initiative grant uh, efforts. Next slide, please. Before we give you an update on our seven youth intervention service programs and basically their performance, we wanted to acknowledge the tremendous job our staff did to respond to this pandemic. Our staff are are committed to their communities and, and they're that raw breed that council member Carrasco and so many of you have talked about. These individuals have all lived the life and have now committed their lives to bettering our, our streets and, our, and, and reaching those most difficult to reach because they have that license to operate. Uh, many of us would love to touch the lives of the most gang impacted in that risk youth, uh, but they're not listening to us. They need to have staff that have lived experience, et cetera. But back to the shifts and the COVID impacts, as you've heard in other presentations, and so I won't go too much into it, but as you all know, we did do a lot of census work. We did tremendous uh, food distribution work. And in another ability, uh, due to the closure of our facilities, uh, we had to pivot in some cases. So our Safe School Campus Initiative team of about 20 interventionists who usually take care of about 100 middle schools and high schools, uh, have now pivoted to our 18 hotspots and are now currently doing street outreach. Uh, they're a tremendous asset to our communities uh, and we're, we're proud of what they're currently doing. Next slide, please, Petra. This bar graph, again, as mentioned previously, the pandemic and subsequent safety measures such as shelter in place, social distancing, and school and facility closures definitely had an impact on most of our program's ability to match our 2019 quantifiables. Again, uh, COVID is reflective of four months of lost service time, nearly half a school year. Uh, to that note, I'm still extremely proud of our staff's ability to stay connected to those youth that we had already connected with. Um, and to continue to, to making them a priority in their lives. But undoubtedly there were uh, hospital closures when the doctors and our hospitals were not running clinics, it had an impact on clean slate. Um, our digital arts with the closure of our Sonol campuses and our community centers also took a hit. Uh, our female intervention team groups that uh, both case manage young ladies and run curriculums at schools 
suffered in the realm of school curriculums. Obviously, schools were closed, but the numbers we have here are based on the case management of those young ladies that were already part of our lives. The one program that was excelling, and I'd say due to that dynamic young specialist we had hired here was our late night gyms. We have four late night gyms at Seven Trees, at Bascom, at Alum Rock, and Edenville. Uh, we were outperforming last year. I think a lot more because of the tournament style uh, gaming we were doing with our most at-risk youth. Um, but that was one of the programs that didn't suffer as much from COVID. Unfortunately, those youth haven't been able to come to our late night gyms uh, for close to a year now. Uh, San Jose Works, our jobs initiative, we were still able to pivot, give kids virtual jobs, uh, continue to provide them the resume building and and all the skill sets they need to be successful in the future. Undoubtedly though, we still suffered some of the uh, deficits there. The biggest hit I would say is to our Safe School Campus Initiative, which is obviously based on incident response to our high schools and middle schools. Again, uh, with all campuses closed, it was impossible uh, to meet that need. Our hospital-based intervention program, also the same um, issue. And lastly though, on our male side of the case management, we were able to keep uh, healthy numbers, much like our female program, because once the kids entered our lives, it was still, we still were able to make calls, use Zoom to the extent the youth were willing to. And uh, we're excited to, to know that we're, many of our frontline staff have been vaccinated, uh, that our tiers are changing and that we'll be able to have a closer touch to the most uh, needed youth in our communities. But that is the performance for 2018-19 as compared to 19-20. As Petra alluded to, we have also jumped on the evaluation model. Uh, San Jose Best obviously is way ahead of us, uh, but I am proud to say that as recommended by the city auditor and agreed by our department, we are embarking on a consultant evaluation of the seven youth intervention services programs with a final report to be completed in April of 2022 that we hope to discuss with you all in our 2023 report to this committee. The evaluation will formally establish a theory of change for each program, develop a method of periodically to periodically evaluate each program and actually conduct its first ever evaluation of all seven programs. These programs have always been successful in meeting and exceeding quantifiable numbers year after year, minus this COVID. Uh, but it, in the spirit of continuous improvement, we really do need to evaluate and make sure that uh, we're doing the best we can to service our youth in San Jose. With that, I'll pass it over to Petra. Thanks, Mario. Um, so as Mario mentioned, uh, intervention is now um, starting their partnership with SPR, the Social Policy Research, and they'll be evaluating youth intervention services. And I'd like to share how, how our, the BEST evaluation has evolved over the last few years. Uh, the BEST grant program has been growing our design to include more administrative data so that we can understand what the individual level outcomes are as a result of participating in a BEST uh, funded program. And so over the last three years, you'll see the design has shifted from mainly agency-based outputs to a more comprehensive evaluation that also includes participant outcomes. And so with this new um, added component um, with participant outcomes comes new tools that we had to implement, such as a participant consent form, which was introduced in 2018-19, and that allowed us to collect individual level ed education and criminal justice data. We also implemented a new participant survey uh, this last year, the year that we're reporting on now, that measures participant um, outcomes, um, like so psychosocial outcomes and satisfaction. Um, we have experienced some challenges as we rolled out these new tools um, and to better understand the challenges, we're working uh, closely with our nonprofit partners and having open discussions. We're also working with uh, social policy research um, so we can increase our survey and consent response rate. Um, and so as we continue to grow the best evaluation design, we are looking at two things. We're looking at, um, or two main, two main things moving forward is a better evaluation system that enables us to show the impact we're making 
um, in the lives of the participants that we serve. And number two, we wanna identify those areas where we need to make improvements, which will translate into better services and better outcomes uh, for our youth and families. And so here we have a summary of best services for the 2019-2020 on, on the right um, column. Um, best provided services in six areas this last year, um, which are also outlined in the best annual report and memo. Um, and most of the services this last year, uh, citywide services, um, but most of them fell within our personal transformation service area, which is mainly um, school-based services. We also had a majority of those that were street outreach services, street outreach intervention services that um, mainly focused on the 18 hotspots in um, the four divisions, uh, the four police divisions in the city, um, case management services. And we added a um, six service area at the tail end when COVID hit and shelter in place um, was put into effect. And that was really in an effort for our agencies to continue to serve our families and the youth during such a challenging time. And so the data you're seeing here, and I, and I know it's a lot to look at on, on this one slide. Um, and what I, what I do wanna share about this slide, um, th this is about our outcome study, the participant outcomes. And this is, um, this is really coming from the new participant survey that we administered um, in 2019-20. And it was the first year again. And what this survey uh, assessed was whether part participants experienced improvements in outcomes such as self-confidence, decision-making, listening skills, um, and problem solving. And what we found um, is that average scores of those participants that were in the program for more than a month um, scored higher or responded at higher rates in areas like handling problems and challenges when they arise and feeling confident that they can handle what comes their way. Um, again, there's, there's more work to do around, we wanna increase survey and consent submission rates, but we are seeing some progress um, in utilizing this survey in, in this first year. And so this is a summary of our 2020 Safe Summer Initiative Program. Um, you know, this program is typically, it starts June 1st. And when we released the application, it was prior to um, the pandemic and shelter in place, but we were able to still move forward and work with the agencies to augment their scopes um, to start program a month later in July 1. And um, we were able to also include emergency services in this grant program along with outdoor activities, um, which were in alignment with the county's um, guidance for summer camps and summer schools. And also it aligned with our safe school, uh, I'm sorry, safe summer initiative grant um, outcomes. And so I just wanted to quickly uh, share some of the impacts, um, which I'm sure you know, you've heard many impacts of the services throughout the city, but our team was also um, affected. We were activated to our, um, our local response team for nonprofit support. Um, and, and with that, with being a part of that team, we were able to offer many resources to our nonprofit partners um, uh, with the uh, COVID resources, with, um, uh, payment plan, um, uh, loans, and a, a number of different resources um, for our nonprofit partners. Um, and we were also able to work with individual agencies. We wanted, we met with them through, through Zoom to understand how were the agencies impacted? What were they hearing from their participants and families around COVID? Um, we provided community of learning sessions to all our nonprofit partners, and they were able to share their experiences their struggles and then share with each other the resources that they were using at the time. Um, and so that's just a little bit about um, how we managed through that. And here you're seeing um, just some of the different unique and, and really um, the, the great services that our best agencies were able to continue to implement during the last uh, two quarters of the 1920 program year. And there were some pro-social activities, um, fishing trips, 
they delivered some essential service, uh, essential needs, basic needs to the families. Um, on the right, there's a, a diaper um, package that was delivered to a new father. Um, up top in the middle is a um, mindfulness kit that Art of Yoga put together for um, the young girls in juvenile hall. And then down below, you see uh, what loads of hope from Tenacious Group. Um, in working with their families, they found that they needed laundry detergent to do their um, laundry. And so Tenacious Group worked directly with their participants to then deliver the participants were putting the packages together and, and, and handing those out to the families in need. And then so looking forward, as we mentioned, we are we are looking to enhance our evaluation um, designs, work closely with social policy research, and we have more work to do. Uh, we have to reassess our data collection tools that it works for both um, individual level output service data and also monitoring our agencies. Um, and we also need to look at how we can we continue to um, enter into data sharing agreements so we can um, evaluate administrative data that can validate the, the services that that the impact that we're having with the services out in the community. And so I that that concludes my piece and I'll turn it over to Mario. I think you wanted to share. I think for the sake of time, council members, uh, we'll bypass a video that we had loaded up at the end for you all to kind of represent both the external funded agencies and the internal passions that we have. It was a, a video on the clean slate tattoo removal program and all the obstacles before our youth. Uh, we could want them to change, uh, but change is difficult. It didn't take them a minute to get into this scenario and it's gonna take a lot of loving and a lot of uh, passion to, to help them along this tra transformational road. Uh, but we'll send those out to you, council member. Again, I, I love showing videos because it's not my monotone vo voice you have to listen to and you get to see the kids and hear from them, but we'll just email that over to you. I appreciate that Mario would love to see Clean Slate and their participants, although I appreciate Petra's, uh, the pictures that you included in your presentation. It gives us a bit of an idea of who those folks are. Uh, we know those folks because they're in our neighborhoods, right? They're in our community and they're part of our families and friends uh, network. Um, and I'm really glad to see that we have more um, positive uh, activities. Um, I like the fishing. I was wondering if that, uh, that young man had actually eaten that uh, fried that uh, fish or was it just for, for show? Um, but uh, but uh, there has been an evolution in services. Um, Petra, do you remember we used to do the chowchilla where when it was still scared, scared straight, right? And it was, that was the norm. And I just see how um, you value and put, um, make this very uh, youth centered. Um, but let me, let me uh, begin with our community comments uh, first before we move on to council. Uh, Mr. Beekman, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and begin your comment. Claire, you can go ahead. Blair, you've been un you've been unmuted. I think we should. I'm I'm going to move on to Paul Soto. We can come back to Blair. Thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, when society fails to address the needs of, of this particular age group because most murders are committed by youth between the ages of 16 and 24. Those are the murders because I've lived with the lifers and the lifers got busted between those age groups. So this is a very critical time because they're, they're, they don't know what it's like to be an adult and they're still kids. And so what happens is the sociopaths in prison look and they it's a psychological game they don't threaten them with violence to join a gang what they do is they look at them psychologically and see that they they 
they go in and they say that they're insecure. They don't have a sense of their own self, of their own self-efficacy in terms of what they can do within their body, to see their body and their intellect as a resource or their spirit as a resource. They, they and, and so what they do is the sociopaths see that and then give them an outlet by which to express themselves. Now, when they're expressing themselves, violence is validated. So now this kid is given an outlet for all of that anger and frustration, hostility, and lack of self-identity. And that violence is affirmed. There's where that, and, and what they do is they replicate that over time. And so it's a psychological game that they play with them. It's not necessarily physical. And so I've spent over three decades of my life in these institutions with these men that do this. And so what I want to do is actually teach what I'm doing. That this is the way that you protect your barrio, homie. Soy Paul Soto from the horseshoe, homeboy. That's what I do. And how do I do that? I go to city council meetings and take tops. You know, I do my research. I do my reading. I sit with a notepad. I sit with a, a, a pen and a dictionary. Those are my weapons of choice by which I defend my barrio. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Beekman, let's try again. Sorry about that. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a real interest how, um, you know, in connection to the last item, how, you know, there's such a weird energy going on this, this past year that uh, how will you address it? Um, I, I felt, you know, the, the equity meeting we had a few weeks ago uh, simply had, excuse me, simply had many, many items that addressed our local community uh, and like uh, more low-income communities to address the ideas and needs of uh, uh, immigrant women. I think it was in in with with COVID issues. I thought was a really interesting way to address, you know, possible gang prevention issues. Um, Another item to, I'm, I'm considering is that, you know, the importance that we're now addressing SROs and the future of SROs um, in San Jose and in the Bay Area. I'm living in Fremont right now and, and we're working to address that issue as well. So, uh, you know, I, what we, well, we all have the promise and hope of what reimagine and equity can do. We can always rely on the new you know, Office of Equity uh, to help with things at this time. But what are those specific things? I described to you my open public policy work that I do all the time and how that can really help where needed. And, uh, you know, and, and, and just, it's just that interconnection between everyday people and its government, uh, how to do that is, is important to learn. So I, you know, just thanks for this item and what we're going to do for this summer and for this next year, how we address all these things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brickman. I'm going to turn now to my council colleagues. I don't see any hands raised, but I know that there's a memo. Council Member Sparza. Yes, I was having some technical issues ironically enough. Um, so in the interest of, of brevity, I'll just get right to it. I know Council Member Carrasco has some thoughts as well. Um, we have had some, I, I didn't submit the audit request for um, the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. Um, but since then, some council members have including myself, have had some concerns about um, the Mayor's Gang Task Force and the best grantees. Um, and we raised those concerns, uh, four of us raised those concerns in November and have been meeting with um, many of the people here. Uh, I think we've had, what, three or four meetings, four meetings, three meetings. So we're about to have a fourth on Monday. Um, to get, to get at that. And, and speaking for myself, 
that came out of a lot of frustrations that we've already discussed because these are interrelated um, items um, and 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 frustrations pre-pandemic about the oversight and the coordination of our best grantees and the coordination with Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. And uh, because the bottom line is, right, our neighborhoods are suffering in so many ways. And, and as I mentioned previously, the neighborhoods that um, we're in are not new. We, we know where they are. We know the neighborhoods that need extra love from us as a city. Um, but I saw some increases in violence, um, again, pre-pandemic, but also throughout the pandemic. Saw a lot of shootings, a lot of drive-bys that were unreported. Um, it took my office six months in one neighborhood to find folks willing to have a community meeting about the violence in their neighborhood. Um, and that was the sixth site that was added during the pandemic. Um, and um, so there's a lot of fear um, in our communities. Um, there's a lot of fear from the violence. There's a lot of fear from unemployment. There's a lot of fear from folks not knowing what's gonna happen when the eviction moratoriums are gone. Um, they maybe only have one or two, you know, two jobs and they're just trying to feed their families, as you know, through the food distributions, my staff, I or my staff are at all of the food distributions in District 7. Um, I know that folks are waiting two hours and more for two little boxes of food. So I'm very well aware of the need that's in the community. And, and we also know that poverty is connected to so many things. And one of them is, is violence. Um, so before I get to the memo, I did want to talk, um, and I think this is a question for Petra, um, on the, I didn't want to lose sight of this, on the data sharing, um, I was surprised not to see Franklin McKinley in there. I thought that that agreement was already in place. Uh, you know, you may be right. I'll have to go back and look at to see, make, to make sure that that is either in place or we're working on establishing an agreement with Franklin McKinley. We do Could have a please? meeting with them. We do have okay. a meeting with them next week on um, some coordination efforts. So I'll make sure to bring that up or uh, follow up on where that the status of that is. Yes, and could you please let me know, um, just shoot me an email uh, because Franklin McKinley is one of the founding um, organizations of the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. And so they're, they're, this is important to them as a school district. It's part of the tradition of partnership uh, for the benefit of the community that is part of the culture in Franklin McKinley. And so if it isn't there, then I wanna help you get one there. Great, um, thank you. So I didn't wanna lose that, I had a little note um, because I wanna go back and explain my memo a little bit. Sorry for that digression, folks. Um, and so we have communities that were already stressed before COVID and then during COVID it's gotten so much worse. And I know that there were a lot of PRNS folks out there for the census, which was the month of September, basically, because council member Carrasco and, and I and our teams, we actually um, cleared the deck um, and were out there every day uh, of the week, seven days a week. Um, and, uh, and so during that time, we were out talking to folks in neighborhoods. And, I, and I've said this to you privately, but I just, I feel the need to say this publicly, which is I've had, during that time, we were out in neighborhoods, giving out ice creams and stuff like that to get folks to come in and, and fill out the census on their iPads. And I had mothers come to me in tears, you know, crying out of desperation. They didn't want to cry in front of their kids. So they would come up, leave their kids at the booth, getting ice cream. Once they had the little ice cream, they'd come over and talk to me and just cry. And so that's where the concern is. That's where the concern that council member Carrasco and I have been talking about. And that's where it comes from. So to hear, to be frustrated that, you know, as we mentioned before, we don't want to be in the same place where we hear 
the same report a year from now. Because I truly don't think some of our families will be here a year from now. I don't know what's gonna happen to them. I really don't. And I wish I had an answer. I don't have one. And that's what breaks my heart every day. And so that's why I know I push, <laughs> I push, and I know you guys know that I push. And you heard Councilmember Carrasco so eloquently in the last item. But those people in our neighborhoods, that's why we push. We're pushing for them. We're not pushing against something, we're pushing for our people. And so I know, I know many of the folks doing this work, the, our frontline workers, I know them and, and I've seen their passion. This is their heart. This is not a job to them. They do this work because they feel it and they love it and they know how important it is. So I don't wanna take that away because we are pushing on some very dry concepts like contracts. But the, the reason we're pushing is because we need those results on the ground in our neighborhoods. And so I know that um, there are some timelines that are gonna be difficult to meet. Um, and so I, uh, I'm gonna make a motion. Um, I know Councilmember Carrasco hasn't raised her hand, but I'm gonna make a motion, which is a modification of my memo. So one, it's to direct staff to return to the full council on March 23rd as part of the audit that is coming to the full council to include two items, which is to identify best providers that did not reach contracted targets prior to the shelter in place order. Two, to provide a report of budgeted staff positions and vacancies for each best provider. And then number two is to direct staff to return to the NSC committee on April 8th with a plan and a timeline on how to A, identify options for improved oversight and accountability of best providers, B, identifying options to evaluate best provider performance using metrics other than units of service to better measure performance as it relates to overall program goals, and C, to develop a crisis response action matrix to solidify criteria in which a crisis response is required. So I feel that because we have been meeting, there has there been has some been work done, done on these on items, items, that this is not only reasonable, reasonable but, it's but it's doable. doable. And so that's, so that's the motion. motion. Second. Thank you. Chair, um, if I could make just a, a clarifying comment. Um, I think we're generally fine with all of that. I appreciate the modification. Give us a little bit more time on, in terms of item one B, which is which is their um, their staffing models and vacancy rates. We don't really have a contractual obligation for them to share that information with us. So uh, we'll ask them. We'll get what we can. I can't guarantee we're going to get it for everybody. You know, one A is fine. We have that information. We can talk about those first two quarters. Um, my preference, honestly, would be to bring it all back on the 8th to NSC, but if, if the committee really wants us to bring that first piece along with the audit, we can just do a supplemental, I guess. Um, yeah, I do. That is that is the desire to bring it to the full council. Um, and uh, that works. Thank you. Okay. All right, one and one amendment. If they do not provide that, if you just note that, that the best provider did not provide that information. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, council member. Um, I was really um, touched by your comment. Um, my phone. Everybody, 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 everybody should. should. Okay, can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think somebody else maybe wasn't muted. 
Oh, I see. Okay. So I'll put back my, my video. I thought something was wrong with my audio. Um, so uh, absolutely supportive of the motion that's on the floor. Um, I do think that there's, uh, there's a lot of really good work that's being done um, by our youth intervention uh, specialists. Um, because if I know how we pick them, we pick them typically from, from our community, right? And these are um, young men and women that have gone through some really difficult um, um, uh, just experiences in their lives and they were able to turn their life around. Um, and so I know that the, the really good work is there. I do think that there needs to be some accountability in terms of, of grantees and what is being rendered during such difficult times. Um, and maybe it's not the same thing, but you have to pivot and we have to uh, be accountable um, to our residents um, because when we take our, our, our eye off of um, our youth, these things happen, right? And, um, and one of the things that, that, I, um, that I'm proposing for priority setting, I know we have our second phase of it next week, is aligning youth programs for this very reason um, in that uh, Council Member Sparza, you spoke about, you know, the systemic inequities that have, uh, you know, through generations just been perpetuated. No one has disrupted them. They are not undone. And this has a lot, uh, a lot of that um, impacts our youth. And so aligning our youth programs, which is one of my recommendations, is part of that because, um, you know, we, Part of being a, 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 a system that is anti-racist, we have to look at the programs not as, a, a, you know, um, our, our, our kids are the problem and now we need to fix them, right? But seeing them as an element of, of, that will enhance our community and it's an investment because they will be the next leaders. Um, and so I think with that, that is that is the uh, that's where I center in that recommendation for for our priority setting. And I think um, you know who knows if it gets chosen. If it doesn't get chosen, I think there's still some value for us to do this offline, maybe through this this committee in terms of aligning our our youth programs from you know from library programs to to the programs here. Uh, under the best and uh, youth intervention because they all have to work off of one another and not in silos um, and youth intervention services can't do it all they can't they just cannot do it all just in the same way project hope can't do it all these programs have to get aligned and the resources need to be there for for our youth um, so i'm really grateful that you are creating this this um this, uh, this, this ask for accountability council member as far as I, so without, I, I'm still, the last thing that I wanted just to say is that I know that, that I had some recommendations um, from the last time that we took a look at how um, we were aligning or um, how we were prioritizing the different um, segments of, of the youth population. Um, uh, with our most challenging uh, gang involved youth being the 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 slimmest of the of the community that we were serving and um and that that is the that is the the youth that we really need to provide the most resources to and they were the ones that were receiving the least um and so I don't know if there's been any progress uh, being done with our grantees to shift that I know this last year was a little strange but there's still some 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 time in between, and so I wasn't sure if if you have an update um, on that. Let me just be clear. I want to understand: Are you referencing um, the piece on the assessment tool? No, it, it's about our best programs, Petra. The best programs were, um, and our grantees, um, when we took a look at the profile of the type of youth that they were um, uh, serving, they were, you know, the, the ones who were gang affiliated, the ones who were gang involved, and, you know, they were serving kind of the, the, the easy pickings, if you will. Um, the, the easiest of our youth to serve, which is not where most of our energy and our um, grant money should be spent on. 
Um, and so was there any shift in our grantees to ask them to um, uh, focus on um, gang involved youth that, that, um, that take a little bit more resources? Yeah, so for 1920, this is the first year of a three-year triennial program, and we um, we ran the RFQ back in ooh, uh, maybe April of 2019. And so in that shift or an reassessment of the eligible service areas, we added additional allocation to the case management service area. Um, and we really looked at the models that were serving that eligible service area when we funded for this year. And so those agencies that were funded in case management are serving the highest need youth, along with the street outreach services, they're only um, providing services to the gang impacted and gang, gang intentional youth. So that's one shift that was done. We're also working with resource uh, development associates consultant to look at a, a screener tool and um, also an assessment tool so we can um, uh, properly assess their risk factors in each target population. Oh, interesting. Beforehand, it was um, more subjective to whoever was conducting that assessment. Yeah, each agency were, was doing their own um, assessment. And so we're, we are, um, we're making progress. We're not quite there yet on identifying a tool, but we are um, set, we are ready to pilot a screener um, in this next year. Perfect, perfect. Okay, the, um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll stop my questions there. Maybe I'll, I'll just connect with you offline, Petra, um, to get uh, answers to some other ones, but they're kind of in the weeds. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move forward. We do have a motion on the floor. Um, so Ruth, if you want, oh, Council Member Sparza. Yeah, I just have one quick clarification. So pulling the contract from one of the best providers, um, it, uh, the grantee, it authorizes, it, grantee agrees that the city's manager, auditor, attorney, or the director, or any of their duly authorized representatives shall have access to and the right to examine all facilities and activities of grantee related to grantee's performance of this agreement, including the right to audit, conduct further financial review, examine and make excerpts and transcripts of all contracts, invoices, payroll records, personnel records, and any other data. Um, anyway, uh, it's in the contract. So they should be able to give us that information. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank Thanks. you, we'll take a look at it. I, I don't necessarily read it the same way you are. You know, that's okay. more about auditing um, and, and digging in, which we're not doing with everybody all the time. So uh, we'll get what we can though. Okay, thank you. Thank you, council member. The last thing I do wanna say is that um, uh, San Jose Works program is year round. This is something I had requested back, I think um, in two, the summer of 2019, uh, or no, previous to that, um, because we had a wonderful experience with our San Jose Works interns. We had Adam and Karime, um, and um, I really didn't get to interact with them because that's our time off, unfortunately, for council. And so I would love to see and be able to um, uh, support our youth all year round with experience in council offices and, and many other offices. I encourage my colleagues to also recruit uh, San Jose intern, um, uh, for San Jose Works interns. Uh, the, and the next one that's coming up, I think this spring uh, cohort is starting March 15th. So we're really excited about that. Um, get on board for the next one if you can't for this time around. All right, um, we have a motion on the floor. Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Carrasco? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Jimenez? Jimenez? Oh, Jimenez, uh, I'm sorry. He had to leave for another meeting. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. So we are on the last item. This is item D6, Citywide Residential Anti-Displacement Strategy Recommendation Status Report. And do we have a presentation? Hi, Reagan. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Arenas and council members. We do have a presentation, but we're also happy to forego it um, given the lateness, it's up to the committee's pleasure. 
Sure. Do you want to just give us some highlights, uh, Reagan? Uh, you know, three minutes. Sure. Sure. So this item is um, an update to our anti-displacement work plan that council approved back in September. And we had um, four prioritized um, items for our work plan. The first was an equitable COVID response. And so we've really been um, working on eviction moratoriums and uh, rent increase moratoriums and advocacy at the federal and state level. Uh, we've also been collaborating on the emergency rental assistance program with state and um, US treasury funds. We have been doing work on um, tenant preferences and have a sponsor for a state bill this legislative cycle. And then we have been um, working on community opportunity to purchase program and we will be launching an anti displacement work group, which will be taking on um, a lot of the uh, development of a COPA program and what that would look like. And then finally, one piece that was added um, that was in our work plan, which was really looking at our boards and commissions and having equitable representation on those boards and commissions. Um, but in January at a council meeting, the council prioritized as part of that work, adding a position to our housing commission for someone that has lived experience. So that's the high level three minute um, version of our work, but I'm sure you all have poured over our memo. Um, so we'd be happy to take any questions. With a fine tooth comb, <laughs> Regan, as always. <laughs> um, I'm going to first begin with our community uh, public comments. Mr. Beekman, go, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, with your last words, uh, you know about uh, improving uh, the commission process. I know uh, people from disability uh, would like a, a seat on on the future of commission uh, representation, and and home and people of the homeless community as well. I think uh, those two ideas have been you know been working for years to get uh, more representation on on boards and commissions, and uh, so good luck in those efforts. And um, I, there was a, there was a few other, oh yeah, I guess, I guess the main thing is, uh, you know, in, in these sort of uh, studies that you're doing for, for things at this time around displacement, you know, I, to really focus on the overall conditions of, of COVID and, and I suppose uh, the funding mechanisms that we're dealing with at this time, uh, is there a way to want to go into those explanations about how rent forgiveness is uh, is actually working and the mechanics of it. I think it can be a way to uh, ease the tension in, you know, I think it's probably lessened a lot over time, but it's probably still there that, uh, you know, how, how, how can uh, tenants feel comfortable with rent forgiveness? How can owners feel comfortable with rent forgiveness ideas? And, you know, the whole process that we're involved with to un understand our lives, uh, how, COVID has been dumped on top of us, you know, we, we've developed skills and mechanisms to understand it and to better explain that to the public. Uh, it's important. I try to do my small part. I'm very literal about it. How can, how can you guys go about it uh, so we all understand, you know, understand our good and not, as I'm saying, <laughs> my new themes at this time, how do we work so we don't hurt each other at this time? And uh, I think there is ways we can do that. And uh, it's important to learn those skills, how to do that. Good luck in those efforts and uh, to all of us. And thank you for this item. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Uh, next we have Mr. Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, it, the reason why we have a racial equity office is because we as a society are trying to insert a moral authority in the allocation of resources for the protection of those that have been most impacted by the discriminatory redlining restrictive covenant policies that is concentrated wealth amongst rose garden and willow glen at the expense of 
not just like a happenstance consequence, but at the expense of the Chicano community of which I'm a descendant of. And so, and, and I've been, been impacted by the social issues, not just the economic, but the social issues that flow from those discriminatory practices. I don't speak Spanish because my mother was beaten and humiliated in San Jose Unified School District. So this is what systematic racism and institutionalized racism looks like from the economic perspective with respect to the redlining and uh, restrictive covenant policies. So we can use a moral authority within the administration of city policy for the purposes of meeting the principles of justice. And so with that in mind, we really need to be able to expand that work. And if there ever was a time and an area where to do that, it's this, because the descendants of those that experienced that in Sassi Puedes are the most directly impacted people. I'm one of them. I am one of them. And so it, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm one man that is doing what I can in my corner of the world to really just Mr. Soto, th thank you for your um, your comment. I'm going to go back to um, our colleagues, and I see Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. So, one on AB 649, are we including the companion bill to that? Um, Mark Berman's uh, was it AB 1143? I just want to make sure we're including the whole package in our advocacy program. And I know this is fast moving because I think Berman just dropped it pretty recently. Thanks for the question, council member, I'm gonna let our um, division manager, Kristen Cummins, who oversees our policy and advocacy answer that. Thanks, hi council members. Um, uh, per your question, there has been a um, discussion about how um, assembly member Berman's bill may or may not echo the bill that we have gotten uh, Senator Cortese to sponsor and so are to author. And so um, I think it's still to be determined. So I'm not familiar exactly with the contents of 1143, but I, at one point, um, uh, Assembly Member Berman was going to introduce the exact same bill. And then we've been talking logistics, whether that was some going to be difficult to navigate two bills with exactly the same language and then try to resolve differences later. So it's just a, I think, a logistics question. But he's very supportive of the concept and really wanted to um, author it also. So that's cool. a good Cool, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, hey, as long as it gets done, right? I mean, I, everybody's yeah. coming on board. So hopefully that results in something happening in Sacramento. Right. Um, uh, so I had a couple, uh, I had another pr uh, question about the um, local landlord work. So is that local landlord or is that local sort of small landlord? Because a lot of folks don't realize that most landlords in San Jose aren't local and most aren't mom and pops, they're big corporates, but the mom and pops like are, are squeezed. And so I just wanted to ask about that. That's a good question. I can comment on that. Um, we are going to start out with people who are represented through CAA and um, potentially other organizations, but we realize there are a lot of um, small landlords really not represented out there, and we've been trying to strategize on how best to reach them and uh, have a conversation with them over time because we think that um, with market changes and all the market stress, they're the ones who are going to be using the state assistance. They're the ones who may or may not want to stay in their buildings. And there, there you know, could be market opportunities. They may want to use this program. So um, we really want to talk to them. And we're trying to figure out the best ways to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. I know CAA has a small landlord group. But um, have we 
do we have we thought about using the existing list of landlords who have participated in rent relief is because that's got to be quite a list is is that who we're um surveying now that's a good point and actually asin um my colleague who is here um who is on my policy team worked we worked on doing outreach for instance on the landlord survey that's going on uh, right now and it's going to conclude shortly and we did use our rent stabilized list um, as a good representation of kind of smaller buildings and then we matched it with other records that were in amanda um, you know in our main database for the city so we were trying to reach really broadly um, but uh I appreciate the heads up on the small landlord group at CAA too. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. And um, I wanted to thank you before my next question. I actually really wanted to thank um, the report for teasing out the barriers for immigrant families um, and the work that the Equity Collective has done. I think it's been huge and, um, you know, eye-opening for some folks to kind of see what's going on in, in neighborhoods that maybe they're not aware of in our city and living situations that folks are, are in that aren't traditional. So I just wanted to call that out because I think that's, um, I think that's really important. And I don't think most systems, as we're seeing in the state level, I don't think most systems are focusing on that. Um, and my last question is, um, on the local preference, um, as this progresses, are we giving the option of families who may want to leave? So as we go into Plan Bay Area, for example, um, and there's people are kind of opening up to the idea of resource-rich communities um, and allowing movement into resource-rich communities, will will we still ha allow folks to go have movement or stay only if they want to? I mean, is that what we're looking at, giving folks those kinds of options? Yeah, that's a good question because fair housing is all about choice, right? right. And we're a big city, so folks have more choices in our city than in a lot of smaller cities. Um, for our local preferences, we could only control their use within our own jurisdiction. That being said, Asen and I were at a meeting today with a regional group called Doorway that is a child of the ABAG MTC or Bay Area Metro. And they're trying to do regional work on tenant preferences. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of people are grappling with how best to serve, how most efficiently to serve the most vulnerable in the, you know, in the apartments that we do have. So I think preferences are designed for us to use our stock most efficiently but other folks are also trying to do the same things. I don't, I don't think that a San Jose resident though, crossing over into Milpitas would probably qualify for their-, their Sure, I'm, I'm looking at a Santee resident maybe wanting to go into the, the Cambrian school district, oh, right? Yeah. That, that, there's a lot of movement within San Jose. And so some folks want, might wanna stay in their neighborhood and um, for lots of reasons. Um, family, culture, you know, jobs, but, but other folks might want to have uh, a different experience um, because there are huge differences in our city. And so I just wanna make sure that we give that choice to folks and we say, hey, you don't need to stay here if you don't wanna stay here. You can, you can go experience this other neighborhood in another part of the city. Um, and so anyway, I'm sure there'll be more, um, reports and discussion on opportunity, um, what is it, opportunity resources, right, is, is the language, I, we change, we call names, all sorts of things. I so know. Plan Bay Area and ABAG and, yeah. um, you know, everybody's using all these different languages, RENA and MTC, yeah. but, but again, those opportunity rich areas, right, where we allow movement. Um, and so I think that's a, an important option for families. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and with that, I'm happy to make the motion to accept the report and cross-reference this item for March 30th. Second. Wonderful. 
All right, so it looks like we have a motion. Ruth? Arenas? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. So that is our last item. So now we will go into um, open forum. Um, and let's see who we have. Okay, Mr. Soto. Uh, thank you again for a really good conversation. I'd like to invite you all to a Zoom meeting that I am conducting in cooperation with San Jose State, Evergreen, San Jose City, and Santa Clara uh, University. The professors from all the schools are going to participate in the Zoom meeting. It's regarding the Fallon statue removal. And what I'm going to be doing is creating a documentary and bringing in La Raza Historical Society, bringing in all of these uh, academics. And uh, we're going to talk about the Fallon statue, what that meant, the history of San Jose, what manifest destiny is, what actually happened here in this city that brought, that, that, that Peter Burnett instituted into this city. We're going to talk about the Barcio Vasquez. We're going to talk about, and it's going to be from my perspective, I'm going to be the one that's giving the presentation. Um, however, we're going to talk with four uh, Sajoneros and Sajoneras, Kathy Napoli, uh, Carl Sotero, uh, and uh, Adrian Vargas, who were involved in the first time when they tried to have the statue removed for the same reasons that we as a community participated in this removal, because we understand our history. And they're going to participate. And so for me as a citizen in this community of the Chicano community to do as much advocacy as I've done on, on this level, to give vindication to my elders, for the humiliation and the degradation and the vilification that they experienced back in the 90s, now are going to be seated in places of vindication and honor and respect and dignity. And they are going to be able to tell their stories and tell the truth about what has actually happened in this city and how people used power, power of the, of, of the mayor's office in order to oppress Chicanos in this community. It's been done too long, and if the truth is to be, then it's up to me. And so I invite you all, there's, there's, there's Zoom in all over the, I have the Zoom advertisements all over Facebook, and I hope you attend. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beekman. If you want to leave that information um, for Tony Tabor, our, our clerk, um, and we can get that um, Zoom information from you. It, it, was, uh, it was Paul Soto. It was, also. It was oh. Paul Soto. Did I say Mr. Beekman? I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Soto. Of course, I. You're at every meeting that I'm in, uh, <laughs> so I knew it was you, Mr. Soto. Um, and we're happy also to to uh, put it on our social media, or at least my social media. I won't speak for my colleagues. Um, uh, to to uh, uh, advertise it, Mr. Beekman. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, I forgot to mention during the uh, Mayor's Gang Task Force item that, uh, you know, I sent you guys a letter a week or so ago, uh, you know, to all around the Bay Area, to Oakland, to Santa Clara County, Alameda County. You know, there's a way to address uh, violence, gun violence and gun trafficking at the state and national level that I think you started programs here that I think are really important and uh, helpful and that don't have to blame uh, you know, people at the local level. And they're important programs. And, you know, they're, they're important ways to address the, the uh, issues of sideshows at this time to include civil rights and civil protection ideals, uh, you know, and the work of the ACLU, the work of care, to invite those groups to your future sideshow uh, task force process is really important. I think it would in, in invite a really important process for all of the community to, to, to participate in. And give a clear message to the sideshow people that some things can be safe in, in, in dealing with this issue and uh, hopeful. Um, there are two other issues I have concerns about. One is the uh, HVAC, uh, the additional HVACs that are gonna be placed in schools uh, in the coming months. Is there a way that, uh, is there an aerosol vaccine process for those HVAC uh, systems? And is, it, is there a way that that can be an open dialogue, to have an open dialogue 
about those sort of topics in the future. I hope that can be easier to talk about. And finally, uh, the ideas about uh, 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 in language interpretation, like for today, it, it's really expensive to have language interpretation for these meetings. Uh, I hope we can learn to cull a way that we can invite city government workers to want to participate in a language interpretation process here on Zoom, perhaps at a, a different rate than, than what Zoom is charging, and but yet pay them well, and, and it could be a good learning. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. My commitment is um, for our housing department to go first in our next NSC meeting as they were last. Um, that concludes our, our meeting. Thank you for taking the time to participate and thank you everybody. Until next month.